Ortiz, vicepresidente de la Declaración de Punta del Este. Señora María José Gardé, presidente. María José Garde, VP of the Global Forum, Saida Marata, Head of the Secretariat of the Global Forum, Francisco Javier Urra of the ITB. Ladies and gentlemen that are here with us from the different competent authorities in the Americas, representatives of the ITB, Global Forum of the OECD, Inter-American Center of Tax Administration, World Bank, Latin American Network for Social and Economic Justice, government officers, and participating delegations. I'd like to say hello to Pascal Santama, director of the Center of Politics, Policies and Tax Administration from the OECD. Welcome to San Jose, capital of Costa Rica. It's for me a pleasure to have you here at this meeting and to be able to share with you during these two days where for the first time since the pandemic began, we will be able to meet face to face on such important topics such as fiscal transparency and to continue collecting efforts in the struggle against fiscal and financial crimes that affect our nation so much. The Declaration of Punta del Este has shown to be an instrument of joint work that reflects the commitment of each one of you that through your tax administrations have added actions for the implementation of the fiscal transparency mechanisms. From this presidency that I chair of this initiative, I've been able to observe the efforts to project our countries through international cooperation offered by the various exchange mechanisms for fiscal, fiscal purposes, such as the Multilateral Convention of Assistance in Fiscal Matters of the OECD. The agreements of uh, tax administration, double taxation, and other multilateral instruments. It's very nice for me to know that most countries belonging to this declaration are also a part of the convention and have joined the actions of exchange in terms of requirements and automatically through the systems uh, such as uh, RECS. As part of the 2023 work, the preliminary, we've been able to see how the various tax administrations have joined for the compliance of the actions to complement this plan. Work that is reflected that have received the best training and the technical support in fiscal transparency. This has been thanks to the support for the OECD of the extraordinary secretariat, the advisors and the sponsors that have supported us in technical assistance that have guided our countries along this route to reach continuous improvement and the best objectives. It's for me an honor and I'm very excited to look at the participation in this meeting and mostly in the topics that we'll be discussing that reflect the high level of this initiative. Since I assumed the presidency, I was convinced that it was going to be a big challenge and I've received great support from the Secretariat of the Forum, the advisors, expert advisors, and of course my team here in Costa Rica. Today and tomorrow, we'll have the chance to elaborate and reinforce the possibilities of improvement. Our joint work as agents of change from our tax administration to reinforce the mission of the OECD in the construction of policies and better tools to improve the life of, lives of people. All of this with a vision for the future of commitment and to strengthen the technical aspects to uh, make uh, tax transparency stronger in Latin America, showing that through joint work mechanisms such as this one can give us results that end up transforming in better revenue for our countries, revenue that we need so much. I'd like to invite you to enjoy this discussion And I would like to make our country are available with the natural beauties, arts, and people that are characterized by respect, right, and service. Welcome you all.
now let me give the floor to Elian Vitegas, Minister of Finance of Costa Rica. Good morning. Good morning, Elizabeth Cabrero, Vice Minister of Finance, President of the Declaration Punta del Este. I would, I'm very thankful for the effort she's been taking forward for us to be here. Oscar Orue Ortiz, VP of the Declaration of Punta del Este. Saida Manata, Head of the Secretariat of the Global Forum. Francisco Javier Urra, Operational manage, Manager of the ITB, a great friend of Costa Rica and also of Latin America. Good morning uh, to all of you that are joining us through the virtual media and good morning uh, to everyone that has been uh, so kind to come here and join us in these beautiful days. We would like today to welcome you all to this participation to the sixth meeting of the initiative of fiscal transparency called Punta del Este Declaration. And it's important to mention why, what's the importance of fiscal transparency and how we see it, at least in my case as Minister of Finance. Why fiscal transparency is important. Is it an end in itself or is there something behind seeking fiscal transparency? I'd like to say that the important thing is when we talk about fiscal transparency, we're talking about tax justice. And when we talk about tax justice, we're talking about one of the ideal mechanisms to achieve social justice. And in countries like ours, countries like Latin American countries at this moment, we're facing a situation that is not indifferent to Costa Rica, which is increasing social inequality. We've reached processes that have led us, unfortunately, to situations where the social inequality has been grown. And in this way, transpa fiscal transparency is one of the mechanisms that will assist us to finish such a hideous process, which is social inequality. Yeah, by reducing, because uh, eliminating is difficult, but in reducing significantly tax evasion, we will be able to have more and better resources so that those that have to pay, pay. And these resources will be used for the benefit of um, infrastructure, education, social expenses, health. And in the end, we're reducing social inequality. So the conversations you have today are on, not on fiscal matters and transparency, but how do we do to make sure to make um, sure that uh, rich are not richer and the poor are poor? Uh, today we have important discussions on this topic because at the end of the day, what's behind what you're doing is how we get more equality in this context. And this is no small task. So for us as Costa Ricans, it's a great honor for you to be here. And we're a, demo a solid democracy where we're willing to uh, take forward the change in office. It's a change in office that is going hand in hand so that the transfer of functions and obligations is more democratic and reasonable, uh, better planned. And actually, in my specific case, I have a meeting with my successor, and it's what's applicable in a democracy like ours. We all know that in the case of Latin American governments, we're facing challenges that are really important. And within these challenges, 
of course, the challenge of the consolidation, of fiscal consolidation is one of the challenges that are critical. And this is most likely one of the important topics is how do we explain people things like fiscal transparency, fiscal consolidation, why fiscal stability in a country is important. And if you allow me, let me, the other day I was in a radio program and people were asking me, what's fiscal stability? When we talk about the Ministry of Public Works, the Ministry of Public Works is something tangible. Sometimes you um, uh, go against it, but the work of the Ministry of Finance is very difficult. No one sees it. Everybody suffers from it. And so I was saying fiscal stability is like when we play soccer. When we play soccer, teams are set up from the back forward. You put a goalie, you have four defense or five defense players, and then you have your uh, goalies. The fiscal stability in a country is the defense and the goalie. What do you do there? You have income, you have expenses contained, you have fiscal expenses that go up and down, and when you're safe here, your midfielders and attackers uh, score. And this is the private sector. The private sector is the one that has to score to get, her, to get better jobs, better exchange rates so that there's no inflation. But when errors are made at the back in the defense, this is where you're going to feel the most because when you see the two defense players and we send them, but they're in very poor shape and they remain at the back of the room, they score because we have less defense players. And what are the goals that they score? When this happens, when fiscal stability is wrong, uh, it's unemployment, speculative exchange rates, speculative uh, interest rates, inflation. And this is because at this moment, the defense that we had to build, which is fiscal stability is not well placed. So we need to improve the fiscal stability to generate jobs, to reduce social inequality and we have to look for fiscal transparency is a fundamental tool for us to pay for there to be fiscal justice so that we can reduce the social um, differences that exist every day. Let me thank you again for having come here to our country for you to join us, for you to be a part of the Democratic Party that we're living right now. I hope the discussions you will have will be very beneficial and not in terms of what you can discuss and learn, but that it's beneficial for the poor people because what you'll do through the work that you do these days is to help the poorest people in society by reducing the gap, by reducing the inequality through tax schemes, through a way of thinking of how we end evasion, of how we have more fiscal transparency and from there on more social equality in these uh, societies of ours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elian Villegas, Minister of Finance, that excuses himself because he'll have to leave in a few minutes. Now let me give the floor to Oscar Orue Ortiz, Vice Minister of Taxation of the Subsecretariat of Paraguay, VP of the Declaration of Punta del Este. Oscar, you have the floor. Thank you and good morning, everyone. It's a true pleasure to share this morning with you face-to-face. Uh, -face. 
Elian Villegas Valverde, Minister of Finance of Costa Rica. Elizabeth Guerrero Arantes, President of the Declaration of Punta del Este, Vice Minister of Revenue of the Ministry of Finance of Costa Rica. Maria Jose Garde, President of the Global Forum. Saida, Sanna, Saida Manata, Head of the Global Forum Secretariat. Francisco Javier Urra, Head of Operations of the Costa Rican Office, Representative of the IDB. And to all participants, to all representatives of the countries, and to each one of the multilateral and cooperation bodies. For me, it's a true pleasure to share this morning with you. It's very gratifying to meet in this sixth meeting of the Declaration of Punta del Este. And as has been mentioned before, the coordinated work we're doing with the Secretariat of the Global Forum is very important. In this exchange of information and in this presentation of the fiscal transparency report, each one of the countries have moved forward one way or another in this intention that around 2018, we had agreed and we had bed to work jointly so that we can have coordinated work. And the result of this exchange of information, how this helps us to move forward in fiscal transparency in the struggle against evasion, multinational crime, and money laundering. This work couldn't be possible without the help of the Secretariat of the Forum and the exchange of experiences between countries, the assistance of multilateral bodies. Like I said, each one of us is moving some faster than others, but everyone is moving in the same direction. And this is very important because, as the Minister of Finance said, the idea with the work we're doing, the purpose is precisely to have the necessary resources so our countries can move forward and work to achieve this tax equality, this tax justice. I don't want to finish without mentioning the great effort that each one of the tax administrations is doing to have the results and that these exchanges are good for this objective the tax administrations have. We're talking about globalization. We're talking about exchange of information requirements automatically. The challenges we're going to have, and this is what we'll be discussing, which is what we need to do, uh, that this objective can be met. And we have big challenges ahead of us, not only uh, for the struggle against evasion, but these exchanges, how they can help us, not only for fiscal purposes, but also to struggle against crime that erode the base, the damage, the countries, and mostly damage equality and social justice. For me, it's very important to approach the work we've done as well. I believe the effort made by Paraguay in these four years has been essential. We've been able to move forward and this wouldn't have been achieved if we didn't have your assistance. And I believe the results we're going to have in a short while in the exchange will be very important because Paraguay is working very strongly in fiscal transparency and everything that has to do against corruption. I believe construction uh, corruption underlies the base of 
uh, democracy and the erode the base of institutions and the work we're going to be doing in this meeting will be very important to move forward in this direction. So thank you so much for the forum uh, in the team of the secretariat and to each one of the colleagues. And let's hope these are two very uh, fruitful days to exchange experiences and to be able to mark the objective each one of the countries has. So thank you, Madam President. It's a pleasure to be in this beautiful country. And I'm also very happy to be in this event. We were separated these two years and just meeting virtually, but I believe these spaces will be good for us to work in a more coordinated fashion among all countries and the various sectors. So I hope you enjoy these two days and that we enjoy the sixth meet meeting of the Punta del Este Declaration. Thank you. Thank you. Oscar, you've been a true partner of the declaration through your contributions from the vice presidency. I'd like to welcome Maria Jose Garnet, chair of the Global Forum, that will be talking virtually. Good morning, good afternoon from Madrid. Vice Minister Elizabeth Guerrero, Minister Villegas, that I think. I don't know if he's left the room. And thank you for your kind welcoming remarks, as well as to thank Costa Rica for having, for its hospitality and for having hosted the sixth meeting of the Punta del Este Declaration. Also, I'd like to say hello to Oscar Orue Ortiz, the Vice Minister of Taxation of Paraguay and Vice, Pre Vice Chair of the Declaration, Said Manata, Head of the Global Foreign Secretariat, and Francisco Javier Urra, Chief of Operations at the Costa Rica Country Office. Uh, good morning, everyone, uh, members, participants of the Punta del Este Declaration, Owners, members of the press and public at large. I'm very excited and uh, I also feel apologetic for not being able to get there because of agenda conflicts that have prevented me to fly to the other side of the Atlantic. But of course, I'm delighted to with these new technologies that allow us to share virtually at least in spirit and excitement to welcome this sixth meeting of the Declaration of Punta del Este. I'm very thankful for having joined you remotely and to celebrate that for the first time after two years lockdown because of the pandemic, that this can be organized face-to-face. -face. And as the previous speaker mentioned, human contact is a lot easier and we can share many more experiences, concerns, and um, work together towards a common objective. Today, uh, we have this very important initiative, the Regional Commitment in Latin America to promote transparency and combat not only fiscal evasion, but other financial illegal flows with the purpose of uh, promoting the development of the region. And it has been mentioned other objectives from justice, equality, and fundamentally to seek for social balance. I have to recognize the minister, the comparison between the minister of finance and the soccer examples, because I think they reflect very well what he's mentioned. In this context, I'd like to recognize the leadership of Costa Rica through the vice minister, Elizabeth, that has been elected as chair of the Punta del Este Declaration as well as Paraguay through Vice Minister Oscar Orev 
VP of the Declaration. I'm also very excited to celebrate the adoption of Punta del Este Declaration. I remember when it was born with 15 participating countries, all of the Latin American members of the Global Forum are signatories of the Declaration. Bolivia has also participated in meetings of the Declaration and has provided valuable information through the Sur Transparency Survey in Latin America. This extensive participation makes evident the regional commitment to promote the exchange of information with fiscal purposes and combat fiscal evasion and other illegal financial flows. I'm truly convinced that the efforts carried out in the context of the Declaration Punta del Este will continue promoting regional cooperation to promote transparency for fiscal purposes and to create positive dynamics for understanding. I am confident your valuable contributions will make of this a very productive meeting to promote regional cooperation and promote the exchange of information for fiscal purposes and achieve these objectives that we're all after. Thank you so much. And I wish you the best in these two days. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Maria Jose Garde. And of course, we would thank you for all the support that you have given us from the Global Forum. I would also like to welcome Ms. Saina Manata and also to acknowledge the leadership that she has had from the Global Forum Secretariat that has had a vital participation in the preparation of this meeting. Please go ahead, Ms. Manata. Thank you very much. Good morning, my dear members, observers of the Punta del Este Declaration. To start, I would like to greet and thank Mr. Elian Villegas, the Minister of Finance of Costa Rica, Ms. Elizabeth Guerrero Barrantes, Vice Minister of Revenue of Costa Rica and Chair of the Punta del Este Declaration, and the Government of Costa Rica for hosting this meeting. I would also like to greet and thank Mr. Oscar Ortiz, Vice Minister of Taxation of Paraguay and Vice Chair of the Declaration, and Mr. Francisco Javier Ura, Chief of Operations of the IDB Office in Costa Rica. I take this opportunity to welcome and thank the International Finance Cooperation, part of the World Bank Group, which has recently joined the Global Forum as a partner to strengthen capacity building technical capacity building, and more specifically as partner in the Punta del Este Declaration. Please be all welcome. Speaking of partners, I would also like to thank the presence and support of the World Bank, of the Inter-American Bank, Development Bank, and the Inter-American Center of Tax Administrations as partners in the works that the Declaration of Punta del Este is carrying out in the region. It is a pleasure to work with partners who are such wonderful friends. I wish to highlight the dedication that Costa Rica has put into organizing this event, which is another example of its reiterated commitment to international standards of fiscal transparency. We also welcome your presence here today, which demonstrates the importance that your jurisdictions continue to place on these issues. It is a pleasure to welcome you to the sixth meeting of the Punta del Este Declaration here in San Jose, Costa Rica. Last year was, within all the limitations we had, a remarkable year for the Punta del Este Declaration. We, important work was done in the region, and we continue working together in the context of the declaration with the collaboration of our partners and the support that is kind of provided by our donors. Notable examples are the launch of the first tax transparency report in Latin America last year, and the, stu the study of the wider use of information exchange and the treaties in Latin America. We also work together with the region's tax administrations to strengthen their capacities, increasing thereby the use of information exchange for tax purposes as a tool in the fight against tax evasion and illicit financial flows. 
In addition, Latin American countries have demonstrated their continued strong commitment to international standards of tax transparency. Today, we can see that all countries in the region that are members of the Global Forum are also members of the Punta del Este Declaration. During the meeting that starts today, we will have very interesting participation from our members and partners. We will start discussing the international tax agenda in the context of Latin America, and we will have the official launch of the Latin American Fiscal Transparency Report 2022. We will discuss about the beneficial ownership standard and technical aspects and best practices to implement the efficient systems that allow access to this information. We will also hear different points of view on how to build sustainable capacities to effectively benefit from tax transparency standards in tax administrations, including the proper implementation of the exchange of information upon request and the common reporting standard. We will also discuss the broader use of information project and the most appropriate ways to implement it. I am sure that this will be a very fruitful meeting that we have good participations of, and that we will be enriched based on all the discussion we have had here. So thank you again for in welcoming us here. Very, thank you, Ms. Saida Manata. Now we have the honor of introducing Mr. Francisco Javier Urra, Chief of Operations of the Costa Rica Country Office of the IDB. The, he, this has been a strategic partner that makes it possible for us to be here today by sponsoring this event. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Before start, I would like to welcome the Minister of Finance, Minister Elian Villegas, Ms. Elizabeth Guerrero, Vice Minister of Revenue of Costa Rica, Chair of Fontalesta Declaration, Mr. Oscar Rue, Vice President of the Declaration, Maria Jose Garde, who is with us uh, remotely, Ms. Saida Manata, and also a welcome to all of you and the all delegations. So I believe that the main points have already been discussed by all of the colleagues that spoke before me. For in the IDB, it is really an honor to be able to support you in these efforts that as I was also mentioned, it is so nice that after two years, it has been done a face-to-face -face meeting that undoubtedly is going to make us all win. As Mr. Villegas mentioned, and also, he mentioned it, the challenges that the ministries of finance have and the challenges all of the tax administrations have, and he pointed out that very well, they have been even higher in during this pandemic, not just from the point of view of the difficult fiscal situations, as I was discussing with the vice minister about the transition that is taking place, ideally, as in the case of Costa Rica, which is a model for all, in the case of the transfer of powers in the finance uh, ministry, but also from the microeconomic point of view, but the challenges that the COVID crisis has brought about regarding tax matters. For instance, we see in Latin American countries, Costa Rica is an example, the efforts that have been done to attract the digital nomads for them to add to the economic growth of countries, but also the challenges that this brings in terms of tax transparency, tax evasion, how to promote the flow of people and businesses while keeping equality and preventing in this sense the flee of resources that as the minister and the vice minister mentioned are even more hurtful, if we could say that, in particularly in emerging economies that do not have in this sense they well-developed capacities to face all of these problems. So I believe that the COVID-19 pandemic has posed a challenge, a double challenge from the point of tax point of view in the more macroeconomic point of view, but also in the sense of keeping the tax standards. The IDB and the Global Forum have maintained a very fruitful collaboration, not just from the point of view of the economic support and technical assistance provided, but in the involvement today with us, and you will see it throughout these meetings, 
Mr. Roberto Ademeker, head of the division. Mr. Ogaldo González de Fruto, who is a leader specialist in tax administration. Ama de Cruz Vargas, colleagues of the highest level from the IDB who have been involved and who also from the point of view of interinstitutional cooperation by represented different institutions, innovations, customer service, tax framework in this sense along the line what the minister was saying of guiding all of these efforts towards the customer service. In 2019, in this collaboration between the IDB and the forum, we had the presentation of the manual on beneficial owners. And in this activity this year today, we will have the presentation as we have them on the tables of the manual for the establishment of successful frameworks of beneficial users. Ultimately, these are physical, tangible examples of technical cooperation that for us is fundamental. I would not to take any longer, but I would just like to take words of Mr. Villegas at a very important roadmap. Ultimately, those of us who work in a multilateral organization, a Ministry of Finance or different agencies, maybe are, we are not as tangible as the example that the minister said about the, public, the Ministry of Public Works, but we are instrumental to be able to provide public services to citizens. And in this sense, being able to do this guided by the principles of equality and reduction of inequality in a time in which technology offers great capabilities, but also great challenges for tax matters. As we have seen over the last few weeks in Costa Rica, we believe this to be fundamental. The commitment of IDB is certain. We will keep it beyond this forum. You have uh, our experts at your service who will provide great high level contributions. I would like to thank them uh, personally for them to move from Washington and Quito to participate in this activity. And finally, I would like to thank the Vice Minister for her leadership in the organization and for giving us this opportunity. It's an honor for IDB to be able to collaborate in this effort. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Francisco Urra. Thank you everybody for your positive messages. And you also give us many challenges here at their discussion table that we are accepting them with the highest responsibility. As you know, addressing all of these challenges that developing countries and emerging economies have to join the global tax administration is one of the main priorities of OECD. In this, meeting, we have the great participation of the Director of Center of Political and Tax Administration of the OECD, who will give in us a general vision of the tax world and the role of Latin America in the, this crucial work. This is why I would like to virtually welcome Mr. Pascal Santamas, Director of the Center for Tax Policy and Administration. Please go ahead. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you Buenos very días, much. Uh, a todos. Uh, to sorry, I will continue uh, Voy a in, uh, en in English. Uh, in English. Muchas gracias. Very uh, happy to be with you. Actually, not happy because I'm not with you and uh, I would really like to be in Costa Rica. Uh, I've been only once, I think, to Costa Rica and only to San Jose when I know it's one of the most beautiful countries in the world. And as some of you may know, there is some surfing, so big frustration, but put the blame on Zaida, uh, who organized it at the time I couldn't come. But I am extremely happy uh, to be able to address you for an initiative which is extremely, extremely important. And not only because it started in an other surfing spot, which is Punta del Este, a few years ago, where I attended the meeting, uh, and I would like to uh, say un saludo uh, to uh, our Uruguayan friends, uh, but because this initiative and the role of Latin American countries is, is very important. So that's something uh, which uh, we uh, believe strongly in. Uh, I think this initiative, this regional initiative, paved the way for other regional uh, initiatives and is um, um, very meaningful in the challenges we're facing. So what is the global agenda and how do you fit in this global agenda? As you know, and we could see a few minutes ago, uh, or I could see on my screen, Maria Jose Garde, the, the chair of the uh, Global Forum, but Maria Jose is also very much involved in the inclusive framework on BEPS implementation that uh, most of you, if not all, are all 
also members of. So there is a global tax landscape which is moving, moving fast and uh, moving uh, quite fundamentally. We started with transparency. And we still have a lot to do on transparency, and that's what the Global Forum does. That's what uh, you all do uh, in uh, this initiative. We then move to the taxation of multinational companies. But there is a link. It's a bit the same story. To tax multinational companies, you need to have information exchange with other countries, with low tax jurisdictions where companies may locate profit and you need to know what's going on there. You need to know what transfer pricing policy is implemented, but also with the headquarter countries where you need to know what the transfer, uh, the, the, the transfer pricing policy is about. And beyond that, you need to have access to what we call the broad picture, country by country reporting is also part of the transparency agenda, even though it's also part of the multinational uh, company taxation agenda. So in that overall landscape, what is happening is very important. One, the current move to automatic exchange of information, which must be successful. We must ensure that you all can benefit from the automatic exchange of information, that the information you receive is complete, that the information you receive is readable, that your information you receive you can use to assess the taxes. And assessing the quality of automatic exchange of information is a big challenge ahead of you all. The other big challenge in your area and uh, uh, we talked about that not long ago with the finance minister, I think it was last week or two weeks ago, with the finance minister of Argentina, Mr. Guzman, is about fighting tax crimes. In Latin America in particular, of the informal economy, but also the criminal economy. We all know the issue of drugs and trafficking, which uh, can uh, have a serious impact on a number of your economies. Being able to fight tax crimes, to organize a better cooperation between the different law enforcement agencies is absolutely critical from a tax perspective and beyond. And your initiative can play an extremely important role there. Finally, in the area of BEPS, fighting base erosion and profit shifting, we have kind of turned the page of the League of Nations environment with the agreement reached by 137 countries on the 8th of October. It was, I mean, almost only six, seven months ago. And this has clearly changed the landscape. One, because we now have something like a safety net of 15% effective taxation to prevent multinational companies, above 750 million euros of turnover, to lower their effective tax burden. This is something I invite you all in Latin America to think of. This is not a developed country agenda. It's a global agenda. And you may want to reflect on all the tax incentives, wasteful tax incentives that you're providing and where you may lose money. You may put an end to the bleeding by implementing Pillar 2. And Pillar 1, which is about the reallocation of taxing rights. It's a very important, significant step towards a, a, a new tax system with this reallocation of a portion of the rent of the largest multinational companies to the market jurisdictions. Together with a subject to tax rule for Pillar 2 and an amount B, and uh, I mentioned amount B because a few days ago there was the uh, conference of uh, SIAT uh, and uh, with uh, Marcio Verdi, we, we were talking about the input of SIAT into the current work on amount B. That's already a lot. And uh, I think that through this initiative, through your cooperation, through your ambition, you can help move this agenda forward. Maybe identify areas where we must be more ambitious. I think as part of the Punta del Este Declaration, there is the wish, the desire to better exchange the information obtained through tax channels 
with other law enforcement agencies. This type of exchange is limited currently because of what we call the specialty principle, but we can see through more recent scandals and other leaks that maybe it's time to rethink this. And I'm pretty sure that the Indian presidency of the G20, India being very tough on these topics, may be interested in your thinking about this. And uh, I will just close by saying that uh, following India, there is a big Latin American country which will be the chair of the G20 and therefore in a position to push this agenda forward further, which is Brazil. And by the way, Brazil is also on an accession path to the OECD. And uh, we are very happy to work closely with Receita Federal uh, and uh, uh, with our Brazilian friends uh, on this. So overall, uh, big frustration not to be physically with you today, but uh, very thankful to the Global Forum for the very good work uh, under the leadership of, of Zaida. So thank you, Zaida. And uh, thank you all for participating, for being active and looking forward to seeing you when we can uh, plainly resume all the trips. Uh, muchísimas gracias. Un beso. Muchas gracias, señor Pascal. Thank you very much, Mr. Pascal, for this enriching vision about the international tax agenda and for you to remind us the good time that we are going through to reinforce the work that we are doing. I would like to take advantage to excuse for those who are virtually because Mr. Javier Ura has had to leave the room, but we are here with representation from other IDB representatives. Now, one of the most expected times, I would like to give the floor to Ms. Hari Damanata, head of the Secretariat of the Global Forum for her to present the main conclusions of the Fiscal Transparency Report in Latin America 2022. Thank you very much, Vice Minister. It is a great pleasure. I have had the opportunity to share with you the results of this report that shows the work that had was done last year in the region and the progress that has achieved at the member countries of the Punta del Este Declaration and an uh, observer that is Bolivia. I apologize, managing technology is not my best uh, suit. Uh, first, I would like to mention that tax evasion and other illicit financial flows are a global problem that it makes it difficult to mobilize domestic resources and that makes it more difficult that also has a negative impact on the credibility of the tax system. And therefore it has an impact on the contributors volunteer willing to comply with their obligation and also assumes a loss of income for the public treasury. This tax evasion problem affects significantly Latin America and all of the countries in the region. And the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, the ECLAC, has estimated that in 2018, more than 217 billion euros were lost, which is equivalent to about 6.1% of the GDP for the region. And we are talking about 2018. This is due to the lack of fiscal compliance. In addition, ECLAC has also estimated that for some countries in their region, the tax gap reaches more than 50% of the revenue, which is not something that can be overlooked because it is something that is affecting all of the countries in the region and their societies who then need this public revenue for governors to be able to provide the services that they need. Initiatives such as the Punta del Este Declaration are highly relevant to tackle this tax evasion and also to foster economic recovery, especially keeping in mind the COVID-19 pandemic that showed the importance that governments have to be able to face 
the challenges and for them to be able to respond to the population's needs. The Punta de Este Declaration, as has been mentioned, was signed in November 2018 in Uruguay, in Punta del Este, as a call to action for Latin American countries to implement international tax transparency standards and for them to be able to tackle together against tax evasion and other financial crimes through tax transparency and cooperation at an international level. Since the inception in 2018, the number of signatory countries that have joined the declaration has been increasing gradually. And last year in 2021, we had the pleasure of welcoming Mexico and El Salvador that were the last two countries that signed the declaration. And this is how we can say today that all of the members of the Global Forum of Latin America are also members of the declaration. And this makes, uh, by the when the cycle closes, we have a very strong commitment in the region with these values and principles of tax transparency. Bolivia is an observer of the declaration and we hope that it will join the other Latin American countries as a member of the Global Forum and as a member of the Punta del Este Declaration. The strong collaboration that we have with our partners, developing partners in CIED, the IDB and the World Bank are key to, for the success of this initiative. And today, as I have said, I would also like to mention that the International Finance Cooperation is joining us as a partner of the Punta del Este Declaration. It is going to be working with us to achieve these goals of implementing tax transparency in a strong way throughout the region. This collaboration with all of the partners undoubtedly is of the greatest importance for us. We do not have the capability of working with all of the countries in the region and respond to all of the demands that it has unless we work together. We would, unless we have a common vision of implementing this work and taking it ahead. So it is really a pleasure to work with such wonderful partners that are highly committed, committed such as yourselves. The members of the Punta del Este Declaration continue working towards implementing the action plan that was agreed for 2021-2023. This work plan expects taking some actions and so implementing some initiatives that I will tell you a little bit what we did last year. In 2021, we created, we raised awareness about tax transparency in the region. And create was not the best word here. We strengthened actually this uh, awareness raise and the activities that we developed help to advance the agenda. And I would like to point out some issues or some problems. One was the publication of the report that said some milestone. This is the first progress report about tax transparency in Latin America that was published last year. And it was the first time that we had uh, true data of what the situation was in each of the country's regions and at the region as a whole. We also had a study, a baseline study on the use of information exchange under treaties for purposes other than tax purposes, what we call the wider use of treaty exchange information. This discuss was this, uh, discussed with the members of the declaration and it has to be used as a baseline for the next steps that we will be discussing during these two days. We also continue advocating for trans tax transparency in regional events in collaboration with the chair of the declaration, highlighting this point at the CI General Assembly, with which we had participations with focus on tax transparency. In addition, during 2021, with the partners, we were able to keep a very fruitful collaboration. And I am going to mention, for instance, with the IDB, we published a new plan implementation manual about 
to beneficial ownerships. Last week, we had the pleasure of publishing Spanish version, which is very important for the region because we have been able to provide guidelines and recommendations for implement this in the language that is spoken by most countries in the region. With the World Bank Group, we have prepared a model of the EOI manual that has been revised and a Spanish version will be published very soon. Follow us because you will soon see the Spanish version in the next upcoming months. And with the SIAD, we are working on a future chapter on international cooperation that will be part of the manual on control of international tax planning. And also we have collaborated in other technical assistance projects, including the context of country specific capacity building programs. We are working together with our partners some of the countries in the region, and this makes that these countries to advance and take very big steps because we are working in cooperation and collaboration, not just with the countries, but also with our partners. Regarding capacity building in 2021, the efforts continue focusing on broadening the technical capacities of tax authorities across the region and on delivering information and training to enhance the understanding of the tax officials regarding the exchange of information and its use in the day-to-day -day work, specific day-to-day -day work. Assistance covered different aspects, including assistance for the exchange of information on requests, beneficial ownership, automatic exchange of financial account information, confidentiality and information security management, and adherence to the Convention on Mutual Administrative Assistance in Tax Matters. Non-member countries of the forum, specifically Bolivia, also received assistance to understand what is included in, a, in, in their probably becoming a member of the forum. And this activity resulted in concrete results that I would like to highlight. Three countries in the region benefited from an induction program, which is a comprehensive technical assistance program offered to all global forum members that joined after 2016. Another seven countries in the region received tailored technical assistance adapted to their particular needs of, and that were very focused. And the forum also continues adapting its training events due to the ongoing global pandemic and offered five virtual trainings, which allowed to train more than 500 tax officials in the region. And these training sessions focused on a variety of topics. And this shows the interest from the authorities and the staff to deepen their knowledge about tax transparency. Also, we continue developing tools such as e-learning courses, toolkits and manuals on relevant topics. And in this case, I would like to stress to e-learning courses on confidentiality and data safeguard, which is a critical element for the cross-border exchange of information. We also developed three implementation manuals. I have already mentioned two of them. The manual on building effective beneficial ownership framework with, together with the IDB and the model about model on exchange of information for tax purposes with the World Bank. But the third one is the implementation manual for the standard of automatic exchange of financial account information. And we also develop several technical tools, including tools to monitor the exchange of information activity and its results, which is very important for us to be able to measure the data and the results that have been achieved with the exchange of information. 
also tools for the implementation of a system of information security. These tools were shared with four countries in the region that are interested in the management of information security. Before getting in further detail about the progress made by the countries in the region in the implementation of the standards, I'd like to show you the figures, uh, the impressive figures that were reached by the region in regards to the mobilization of income. The efficacy of the exchange of information is measured by how information is used to comply with tax laws and to generate additional revenues. So revenue is the only way to measure, and there's an effect on how to measure the behavior of taxpayers that we can't measure, but we can measure the revenue identified through um, the exchange of information. And the results we achieved in the survey of fiscal transparency in Latin America say that the efforts of the countries in the region are generating additional revenue. From 2019, we identified 25,700 euro in additional income through disclosure program, offshore investigation, and the use of exchange of information in general. If you look in greater detail, we have that the use of EOIR brought additional tax revenue for 2.6 billion euros during 2014 to 2021, of which 261 euro, a million euro were collected in 2021. In 2018, one country alone reported extraordinary tax revenue gains due to EOIR of 1.7 billion euro. And the deterrent effect, as it should be, of the implementation of AEOI has, is impressive. And this can be measured, for example, through the pro uh, voluntary disclosure programs that were launched prior to the first uh, automatic exchanges by some countries in the region. Until 2021, these programs raised at least 21.5 billion euro in additional revenue. The figures make it be bigger in reality because most countries are not systematically identifying where they're seeing the collection and if it's related with EOIR, but only do so on a case-by-case -case basis as they report. But if we had a systematic measurement, I'm sure the results will be even better. Countries have different approaches to report the income generated and some countries rely on revenue identified while others do on revenue collected. The Global Forum is working with countries to ensure that they monitor and record the revenue generated as a result of exchange of information. So we're not asking countries to change the way to control, to celebrate the exchange of information. Implementing standards is a major task and involves putting in place the legal framework and the necessary practical infrastructure required to carry out all forms of exchange and therefore mobilize domestic resources. The success of this journey depends, as we've seen in the opening of this uh, meeting, of the political commitment of the importance attributed by decision makers 
and authorities in a country to this topic. Therefore, it's very important to measure the importance of this topic to the region. And results in 2021 show that the result of the Latin American countries is still very strong in this area because 81% of those surveyed have given a great priority to this topic in the region. And countries have said that this priority is based on the needs of having a solid network of partners for the exchange of information to use the exchange of information, not only to reinforce the auditing and fiscal control processes, but also to face other financial crimes such as money laundering and, fund and terrorism financing and combating corruption. The median priority given by three countries in the region, 19% of the respondents, is mainly explained by the still limited awareness of auditors who are one of the main players in the process since they're the ones that trigger requests for information under requirement. And talking about the request of information, we have the pleasure of celebrating that the region has shown extraordinary growth of the number of requests of information sent for the partners. And these requests are originated from audits and cross-border audits and investigations. And with them, we get critical information and therefore, Fiscal auditors may provide a continuity to their investigations and audits and identify exactly the amount that should be paid by tax players. Without this information, this wouldn't be possible. And in the context of the declaration, countries in the region have committed to increase the number of requests sent, while at the same time means uh, increasing the number of audits and investigations on cross-border operations. The results indicate that in general, the region as a whole has improved its performance due to the fact that some countries have taken very specific measures to increase the use of this tool for their domestic investigations. We had an increase of 103% with respect to 2020. And this progress in the number of requests sent was driven by the notable increases in four countries. I'd like to mention Peru that has gone up 2,000, over 2,000%, 2000 Panama with over 600%, Argentina over 200%, uh, percent, and Colombia 53%. And in general, the region was a net sender of requests that sent 649 requests and received 392. But if this makes us celebrate, on the other hand, there's still a very strong disparity among countries in the region. And most of the countries in Latin America are still not using as much as they can these uh, networks of information exchange. As you can see in the figure, four Latin American countries were responsible for over 90% of all the requests sent in 2021. In one country alone, accounted for 55% of the requests sent, which is Argentina. The progress made by these countries are the result of awareness raising activities from fiscal authorities, auditors, and researchers, and an improvement in their knowledge in the use of these tools that are available today for all countries in the region. Some countries are also using information related to which received from automatic exchange of CRS and based on this to begin an additional request for information. And the results have also been positive to date. These results also indicate 
that when countries allocate more efforts and resources to raise awareness, train, and support fiscal officers, the use of this tool can be very evident. And all of them are very encouraging. I think I'm going to need help to go to my next slide. In Latin America, in Latin America, the framework aimed at ensuring transparency on beneficial ownership information is still in early stages of implementation. And we're focusing on this because this is very relevant for fiscal transparency and for the exchange of information. Countries that fa face challenges to implement the standard on fiscal beneficiaries. And an important challenge is the definition of the approach of policies that is the most suited for the country taking into account their legal and organizational circumstances. As can be seen in our new beneficial ownership toolkit, toolkit published jointly with the IDB, countries can use First, a single approach usually based on existing information held by obliged persons until the money laundering uh, framework or a multi-pronged approach comprising different sources of information. These sources can include the anti-money laundering framework information held by the entities themselves and the entity approach and a central beneficiary a beneficial ownership register held by a public authority that is known as the central register approach or the tax authority also known as the tax administration approach. The results for 2021 show that 10 countries in the region use two or three approaches for ensuring the availability of beneficial ownership information. Evidence a trend to a multi-pronged approach. Nine countries in the region already use central registers of beneficial owners, whether it is in the hands of the tax authority or another authority. The lessons learned from the peer reviews in the global forum on exchange of information upon request indicate that a multi-pronged approach generally leads to a more solid beneficiary ownership system with better results. As you can see in the figure, the results uh, for the eight Latin American countries assessed by the Global Forum in the second round of assessment so far indicate that countries using a multi-pronged approach generally have better results than those who use one single approach alone. However, Using a multi-pronged approach does not automatically lead to an efficient beneficial ownership framework as gaps could still exist in relation to some aspects of the legal framework or its practical application. However, where we can say that the approach, the multiple prong approach has the potential of generating more solid results but this doesn't mean that automatically in implementing a multi-pronged approach countries are fine because we also need to work with the legal framework and the practical application of this framework. Now, 
going to the automatic exchange of financial account information. This is moving forward in the region. And this is very important because it's a, a critical framework for the struggle against um, fiscal crime. In 2020, information on 75 million financial accounts were exchanged under this standard globally, covering at least around 9 trillion worth of assets around the world. Latin America is increasingly participating and committing to automatic exchange. The first automatic exchanges in Latin America started in 2017 with three countries. And since, since then, other countries, seven countries in the region have started their automatic exchanges. The last country that started these changes was Ecuador in 2021. And five other member countries have not yet uh, committed themselves to implementing automatic exchange of information within a given time frame. But the Global Forum Secretariat and partners will continue working to define the right date for these countries to implement the standard and benefit from this information. The effective use of data obtained through automatic exchange is beginning in the region and unquestionably it's a powerful tool to detect undeclared financial accounts and comply with the legal standards and it this was initially benefited by the beginning of the automatic exchange for this to effectively represent a change in the behavior of taxpayers and to generate a virtuous a cycle that will generate more compliance and it's necessary to use this information. Seven out of the 10 Latin American countries already uh, performing automatic exchanges use the information received in their tax audits and investigations. Five countries use it for risk assessment and tax audits and three for tax collection and four countries for taxpayer notification. So they say, we have this information and we hope this is in the next declarations that you will submit. And the Global Forum and its partners will continue to work with these countries to progress on the effective use of this data and uh, for domestic resource mobilization. To this end, in 2021, we published an integral strategy for the creation of capacity for the successful implementation of this exchange for developing countries. Also, it's essential for countries to have a solid infrastructure for the exchange of information. The ex exchange of information units should be set up and allocated with adequate technical and human resources so that they're appropriate for this exchange and for this to be carried out with the timeliness and quality that's necessary and the administrative assistance in tax matters. The fact that the unit has allocated competent authority guarantees that the processes will be dealt with effe efficiently and effectively. And these are all factors that should be considered when carrying out surveys and assessment of the infrastructures countries have. The results for 2021 show that the countries in the region already have solid exchange of information infrastructures. 15 countries have already uh, created a specialized unit acting as a competent authority and with manuals and support tools. 12 countries have implementing tracking tools for the exchange of information, enabling them to better manage and monitor EOI activity. And this is an area that's still key for interest and support for the Global Forum. I can't see my presentation, but I'll continue. Uh, but because we have time constraints, I'll continue and I'll show it. 
the fiscal transparency report in Latin America shows that it's necessary to encourage the capacity building in exchange of information within the tax administration. The level of knowledge perceived on exchange of information should continue to be improved because 10 countries in the region already said that the level of knowledge, particularly among tax compliance staff is medium and six countries rated it as high. The number of countries considering having staff with a high level of knowledge um, on exchange of information decreased by 25% compared to 2020, which can be partially attributed to more experienced staff leaving the tax administration, relatively low practice in exchange of information or exchange of information unit recently implemented. And we will continue working with officers to move forward in their training. The networks of exchange of information keep growing in the region. And this is essential because the exchange can only happen if we have an international agreement so allowing it. And most countries in Latin America have an extensive network of exchange of information thanks to their participation in the multilateral convention. With Paraguay having deposited the instrument of ratification in July 2021, Almost all Latin American countries, members of the Global Forum, are now parties to the multilateral convention. Moreover, in January this year, Honduras received the formal invitation from the coordinating body to become a party to the multilateral convention. With Honduras, the full circle of EOI relationships will be complete for Latin America Global Forum members. And we will be able to have this very powerful instrument that allows at once to have access to information of over 140 countries. One of the possible areas of work exploited in the declaration is the wider use of treaty exchange information. As we've discussed from the very beginning in this meeting, this is an area that is very strong in the declaration and the information exchange can be used based on the information exchange agreements for fiscal purposes and other purposes to combat other illegal financial flows. And in the meeting of the declaration in November 2021, a baseline study was presented on the wider use of information in the countries in the region. And the study concluded that the majority of the Latin American countries do have international and domestic grounds for wider use. To date, only one country in the region, Argentina, has a strategy for the use of treaty exchange information for non-tax purposes, which has been used in practice. To stimulate this wider use, the form has proposed further work in this area. And maybe we're lucky to have a pilot project among countries in the region for them to get started to implement this wider use with a wider strategy from the government to combat illegal financial flows. Tomorrow, we'll have the chance to discuss in further detail this plan and proposal so that you can see the documents, the working documents, the uh, uh, customized agreements, a possible definition of this project, and um, training courses on confidentiality and data protection for authorities that can have access to this information. Looking at the future, I can say that after two years of the COVID-19 pandemic, face-to-face um, -face, uh, meetings have already started and on-site missions in 2022 to strengthen these projects and activities um, for capacity building. This is the first uh, face-to-face -face meeting 
we have had from the beginning of the pandemic. And we're very happy to have it here in Costa Rica. And this is a very important topic for fiscal transparency, which is the Punta del Este Declaration, the commitment of the partners to advance in this topic, even with innovative practices, such as the use of exchange of information under the treaties for other purposes. For this year, the plan includes working with governments to create sustainable capacities for exchanging information. And the Secretariat of the Forum offers a train the trainer program for Latin America this year. It's a program that lasts for a year and seeks to train staff in tax organizations so that they can train their own people in such a way that this is more sustainable. And this formation program focuses not only on the technical knowledge, but also on the practice of teaching and discussing cases and that this adapted to the reality in the region. I hope next year we can share what happened this year with this program. Also, we will work hard to guarantee that countries in the region have a solid and effective framework for the exchange of information upon request, and among other things, guarantee the transparency of information on uh, final beneficiaries. The efforts to raise awareness of non-committed Latin American countries on the potential of the standard for automatic exchange of information on the technical support available for the implementation of the standard will continue so that these countries can be able to make a, a, a conscious decision on the right date to begin this automatic exchange. And we will continue helping countries to begin implementing a wider use of information to further take advantage of it for non-tax purposes. And if we're able to have a pilot project, uh, we can discuss this next year. We also have a project to encourage female leadership roles and gender balance in tax purposes. And I have to say, this is a very dear project to me. I have, I'm, I have the pleasure of having started this project, which is women leaders in tax transparency. And this project started this year, it's a pilot project, and we have some women in the region already participating. And next year, I will talk more about this. And finally, we will continue looking for the promotion and commitment at the highest political level because this is fundamental to advance uh, with these topics. And with this, this cooperation with the partners in the region is fundamental. Finally, I would like to say that it is not only a pleasure to have the support of the donors, but without them, none of this could be possible but also that we're very happy to have the trust they deposit on our work. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Ms. Saida, and to all the team that is working with her to continue with this purpose on the project advanced in 2021. I would like to stress two important aspects and one has to do with the increase in the exchange of information that is reported and how the figures also evidence that this has become a benefit for our countries, which encourages us to continue working along these lines and to seek better opportunities for improvement in the work that we have been doing. We are going to go at coffee break in which I respectfully ask you to 
only take the 15 minutes allowed considering the people who, that are joining us virtually, but because we on a break, I would like to give a huge round of applause to each of you, both men and women who have cooperated from your tax administrations and different institutions for the results that we have been presented today to become a reality. El Sustainable Development Capacities in EOI is one of the focus of declaration of companies in the next few years. In this session, the speakers will share their experience as a point of view about the needs and challenges related to the EOI capacities and how to raise awareness and effective competencies for the tax administration to be capable of using the exchange tools to support the tax authorities and other compliance authorities. It is a pleasure to introduce and great colleague as a moderator of this meeting, Mr. Carlos Vactor, Director General of Taxation of the Ministry of Finance of Costa Rica. Please go ahead, Don Carlos. Good morning, everybody. It's not good morning, good afternoon, because we really don't know when, uh, depending on the countries that are virtually in this meeting. It is a pleasure for all of you who are visiting us here uh, in presence and that are sharing with us this session. During this session, regarding the creation of sustainable capabilities for tax capacities for tax transparency, we are going to focus on the fiscal transparency report 2022, which poses great challenges for tax administration in terms of exchange of information, especially regarding with EOIR and the capacities of the administrations are diverse in terms of the development that each country has. And this gives us uh, many opportunities for improvement to all of our administrations. So the exchange that we could undertake in order to see how we can collaborate in the construction and the building of these capacities is very important. I have the pleasure, in addition of sharing the table with the vice minister and chair of the forum, Elizabeth Guerrero. I also have the honor of being having with us Agnes Roja, who is a tax policy advisor of the Global Forum Secretariat, who is with us here. Mr. Gonzalo Arias Esteban, Cooperation and International Tax Director of the Inter-American Center for Tax Administrations who will is also here with us. Thank you, Don Gonzalez. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. Once again, Mr. Jorge Coronado, uh, dear friend, representative of the Costa Rica Office for the Network. It is also a pleasure to have you with us, Latin American Network of Economic and Social Justice. And a personal friend who is visiting us from Paraguay, Mr. Oscar Uruguay Ortiz, Vice Minister of Taxation of the Undersecretariat of State of the for Taxation of Paraguay and Vice Chair of the Punta del Este Declaration. With no further ado, I would like to give the floor to Ms. Agnes Rojas so she can share with us her uh, opinions and her points of view. Thank you very much, Carlos Vargas. Good morning to our panelists, colleagues, Gonz Jorge Colorado, Gonzalo Marias, the Vice Minister, and Oscar Orue. It is a pleasure to be here with you all today in this is meeting of the Punta del Este Declaration. First, I would like to explain in further detail why the countries have difficulties with regards to the implementation and the use of the exchange of information. As many of you probably know, the implementation of the transparency standards and exchange of information for tax purposes can be a very large and uh, for countries, especially for countries in development. This is because to implement standards, countries need resources, staff, infrastructure, and knowledge. This is a complex tax because it requires, in most of the cases, reformulating legislative, legislative frameworks, operational frameworks, organization, and practical infrastructure. But throughout countries, the countries in the region, and in many cases, with the support of the development partners, 
have done great progress in the implementation and in particular in the creation of infrastructure to exchange information. In the particular case of Latin American countries, the use of this infra information to fight against task evasion in a cross-border level is very unequal. And one of the reasons that has been identified for this unequal progress is the level of knowledge regarding the exchange of information. As we have seen a while ago in the presentation by Saida Manata, part of the conclusion of the Task Transparency Report in Latin America, 10 out of 15 Latin American countries analyzed in the report consider that the level of knowledge on exchange of information is medium. And this is a situation that mostly concerns tax auditors. And tax auditors are very important stakeholders in the exchange of information network because they are the ones that in practice start the request for exchange of information to use them in their cross-border investigations. And it is the tax auditor do not know the exchange of information tools that they don't know the benefit. In practice, they are not going to initiate requests for exchange of information with their unit. How we have also seen that as part of the results of the report, that using training and awareness raising strategies that have been implemented by a series of Latin American countries, and specifically last year, countries can move forward significantly with regards to this standard. This is related to the standard of exchange of information on request. The standard of ex automatic exchange of information is a much more demand standard for countries in terms of its, their, its implementation because it requires capacities, abilities, and especially a confidentiality framework that has to be proper. It's not an easy task, but also we have seen that with a commit, an informed commitment by the countries and with the resources and training, training, I would insist that is very important. Countries can implement the standard for automatic exchange of information. In the last two years, we have seen successful examples, such as Peru that started exchanges in 2020, Ecuador that started the exchanges in 2021, and the Secretariat of the Global Forum, of course, is willing to provide support to the countries in the region that have not yet started the implementation of this standard. Finally, Another challenge that the countries are facing is the effective use of financial data received as part of the automatically st uh, standard of automatic exchange of information. This is also a complex tax because it requires having knowledge and capacities in terms of data analysis and management of large amounts of information. But also in this case, I would like to stress that countries can advance in this uh, environment. And in fact, we have also noted this in the Transpar Tax Transparency 2022 report. Some of the countries had already starting to make effective use of financial data, and even in some cases with the support of the Secretariat of the Forum, Global Forum. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Rojas Gonzalo. The floor is yours. Given the fundamental role played by SIAT as a support organism for tax administrations, what are the main challenges that from the SIAT perspective you have uh, foreseen that government or organizations and countries face in terms of development of capacities for exchange of information? and exploitation of, of their this use. Thank you, Carlos, for the question. Before answering, I would like to congratulate the Ministry of Finance and, and the OECD 
and the Global Forum for this activity, I believe uh, we know the, how difficult, challenging it is to organize a hybrid event. So there's a lot of work behind this activity. So congratulations, also congratulations for the initiative of the Punta del Este Declaration and the achievements you have made and the wonderful report that you have supported that requires and compiling data, verifying them and achieving and drawing conclusions, but it is necessary to understand what is happening with the exchange of information and the declaration of Punta del Este. And now to answer your question, it is a question that is not easy to answer in just a few words. We have been working on the exchange of information for a long time since the 80s, the ad had the first agreement for exchange of information that was updated up to the beginning of 2000s. In 2006, we published a manual for the exchange of information published together with the OECD. And that, in fact, everything moved forward after 2010 when it was a political support and support of the G20 to the work done by the OECD, the international community. Before this was like countries in Latin America said, this only belongs to the rich countries. The exchange of information that is applied to me, international taxation is not a priority for us. Countries have more progressed a lot for us, to be honest. And the exchange of information in a strict sense. We did have not faced uh, many difficulties in implementation, such as the design of standards, the construction of offices for the definition of internal procedures, all of this is has been very well developed by the Global Forum and its partners. We have manuals, models of norms and standards. We have experiences of countries that are replicate, replicable. But where do we face the most challenges? The issue is most closely related in the availability of information, access to information, and the use of the information. And then we see the political aspects. Implementing norms, how standards has been a great challenge for all countries. Having a larger agreement on network until we had two or three exchange agreements for exchanging of information, open closes and close closes in terms of exchange information. The use of information for other purposes was still pending and the declaration of Punta del Este put it on the table and it was more than strategic to be able to move forward because sometimes tax authorities do not want to look at this because auditors have a lot of work and they say, if I'm not going to work to report and elicit that does not contribute to my indicator, which is to find the adjustment and collect fund revenue, there was not a single vision or government vision that was one of the limitations that we have been working with and we are trying to promote. And this is one of the most important aspects in the Punta del Este Declaration, in my opinion. So the issue of the beneficial owner is also a challenge and also advancing on mutual assistance. For countries, we're afraid to move ahead in assistance in collections. Some of them, there were reserved in the multilateral agreement in terms of the documents. But from the administrative point of view, I have noticed that challenges are even bigger because the challenge is even bigger. The work is even bigger. The exchange of information plays a role. It's a means for an end but it's an end in itself. When is it an end in itself? When we want to cooperate with others. We want to cooperate with another country, giving them the information they are requesting. We are working with that means, but it's also an end. So what is important to have the basic pillars of the administrative taxation strengthening. If the basic pillars do not work, the exchange information doesn't work. And what do I mean by this? design of internal data bases, use quality of, of information. I have a brief anecdote. A company called us to the CIA and said that they wanted to come out with a risk management system that uses data that usually the tax administrations use to detect signs of evasion and collection. And for that, they use algorithms and big data. And the CS answer was great. But first, we have to use algorithms and big data to make sure that the information is of good quality. So this is the prior step. Without quality, we will not have a good exchange of information. The other topic is safeguarding confidentiality, which I believe everyone have this clear because it also required a lot of work and investment and also working on the risk processes, intelligence, and auditorship. And I'm going to talk about a very important topic, which is organizational culture. 
as I said before, there is not a culture to exchange information with other tax authorities, but we have to build this culture. We have to make people work more to use these tools even more. There is not a culture of using public data. Public data helps us to know what information to request abroad, to fine tune the request of information, but there is no culture or knowledge very often to identify corruption, money laundering, and other non-tax crimes. The focus always is on taxation and opening our mind to be able to identify these other topics and use information in all senses. It is also a cultural issue for institutions. International taxation is something new. We have been talking about this for a very long. It seems that it has always been around in Latin America, but according to the CIAT statistics, transfer Pricing, price transferring authorities in 64% started in the second decade of the 2000s, not a long ago. And VEPs appeared after 2015, where countries started implementing this. So taxation is a new topic in the region, and the exchange of information is useful to make effective the standards related to international taxation and assistance in collection also requires a very strong collection unit. Another important topic has to do with human resources and financial resources. When CIAD provides technical assistance, many countries say, this is going to take time away from my work and people don't have time for technical assistance. They are working on what they have to do. So it is always important to have sufficient resources to be able to respond to external internal cooperation and increase the level of productivity. And this requires good planning. Although we do everything possible not to take away time and assist as necessary. And financial resources, of course, everything sounds nice, but we need to invest. And this has to be clear. I, um, ministries have to understand, countries have to understand this. These were my comments related to this, and these are some of the challenges that we have identified. Thank you very much. Gonzalez, you have talked about very important, relevant topics, beginning with the last ones that I would like to retain in terms of planning, because then as we can visualize and yeah, and within the planning, the spaces for people to be able to be trained they, and also start generating in the sense of belonging in terms of the importance of the exchange of information and how this can benefit all of the countries. Undoubtedly, is going to provide the uh, inputs to continue growing. You also talked about the PEPs and transferring, price transferring, but I would like to talk about the VEPs because in VEPs, um, I think that the participation of civil society has been fundamental. Yeah. Uh, the transparency is not just from the point of view of the exchange of information among tax administrations, but also transparency for civil society purposes is also very important in this sense. Jorge Coronado, representative of Latin American Network of Economic and Social Justice. I would like to ask you, Don Jorge, the role of the civil society in the advancement of the fiscal transparency agenda, tax transparency agenda. How does Latin uh, be, see this element? And how can we visualize the participation of entities such as Latin data and other transparency organizations in the participation of the civil society in these countries and how they can help us to generate the necessary space to be able to move forward on these issues, on these matters. Thank you very much, Don Carlos. I would like to start by thanking the Ministry of Finance for the invitation to the Vice Minister and the Global Forum that in this very important activity, I would like to also uh, congratulate you for the advancement of the Declaration of Punta del Este and the commitments that the countries have been undertaking because on global transparency. I would like to start saying that from our perspective, tax issues are not technical matters, exclusively speaking, but they are topics that are 
under the jurisdiction or that are important to all citizens. And we say this because as long as we have transparency, as long as we have progressive tax systems, as we have sufficient revenue, we are going to the states are going to be able to develop public policies for inclusion or redistribution. And this is the aspiration of our countries. And in this sense, it is fundamental to link the technical entities that specialize in the government with the civil society stakeholders that more and more we identify more civil society actors that are worried about this agenda. Having said this, and to answer to your question, the struggle for fiscal transparency is one of the main demands of society at large in a region and globally. And specialists, experts, multilateral organizations, governments have been saying that one of the largest barriers in terms of international fiscal control is the opacity that still exists globally. And we know very well that the abuse and fiscal fraud uh, is based fundamentally on this opacity through access to information as well as much of the legislation in our countries. And much of this legislation has been created to protect practices that erode the collection capacity of our states. Part of these practices, as you know very well, is aggressive fiscal planning, the role of the facilitators, the financial secrets that become a big partner and that end up leaving in the shadow the effective beneficiaries. To make, from our perspective, this transparent goes by modifying um, negative practices, as well as to make access to information transparent and the exchange of said information as the first step. Now, there are important pr uh, problems, and this is where we find ourselves in a role as civil society. We see different directions in this cooperation. First off, it's important to strengthen the exchange on technical aspects, specifically in terms of fiscal transparency, in order to share experiences. Secondly, we would like to say um, need to strengthen one of the most important lines of action that we've developed here with Gonzalo from CIAP, which is the permanent relationship of events, activities between CIAP and different tax administrations and entities from civil society. What do these permanent exchanges allow us at a technical and political level? It allows us to approach various fiscal matters. It allows us to raise awareness uh, on government entities and civil society on the roles and needs of everyone. It's also important that civil organizations incorporate in our agendas the urgency of appropriating a demand, which is a historical demand uh, for the fiscal administration. As civil society, we need to be the most important promoters that indicate the need 
of strengthening the technical capacity, the technological capacity, and human resources of the tax administrations in having more solid tax administrations, we can jointly combat the opacity and strengthen fiscal transparency. Two final matters. Include that on the other side, government organizations should be aware what our most important demands are in terms of fiscal transparency as civil society. And we understand that much of the debate in fiscal transparency goes through convincing political operators to make the specific modifications. And it seems important for us to have this exchange. In other words, we see a process and a strategy in two ways. It's true that it's a relatively new relationship. The fiscal matters were not the topics that were in general uh, uh, the agenda of the civil society. And there hasn't been a culture of the experience of exchange from the administra tax administrations and technical bodies of interlocution with the civil society. And we've been breaking these paradigms and with the Global Forum, SIAT, and the Ministry of Finance. Now that Gonzalo started discussing anecdotes, uh, part of this was seen in Costa Rica with the multi-sectorial dialogue where based on this delay relationship of tax matters, we were able to reach an agreement on the need to promote a group of procedures of uh, reforms in fiscal matters. And this is part of this permanent exchange that is fluent and that we can develop between both parties. Thank you. Thank you, Don Jorge. Social dialogue is fundamental in this area to generate systems and spaces where tax justice is what guides us. And in this regard, I'd like to ask Don Oscar, with whom I've shared in different fora and that I've seen in an effort to share with the various players in Paraguay, to share the efforts of the Undersecretariat of Paraguay. These matters, the raising awareness, effective competencies in terms of the exchange of information and how this has helped towards technical support in the and the secretariat uh, of the forum so that we can move forward. Thank you. And again, I'd like to thank you all for the invitation and for this participation, first of all, to build sustainable capacities, which is what has us here today. We not only need to talk about establishing standards and passing laws that allow for the exchange of information, but the most important thing is that this is sustainable in time, generating capacity. And how do we do that? We not only do that by having an organic structure, but basically betting on HR. I think it's very important to have the support of the CIAD, IDB, and all bodies to generate this knowledge experience in officers, because 
at the end of the day, they're the ones that make it possible for auditors, investigators to meet the objective, which is to use the exchange to uh, achieve better collection, to struggle against tax evasion, which is what we're all after. When we talk about building this capacity to encourage uh, government officers, because it's not easy, and I can speak out of experience, and I know it happens to many of you, that the private sector always attracts the best government officer to take them there by paying better salaries, by making an effort to attract them and to go to the private sector where at the end of the day, they can make more money. So generating training, establishing an organic structure where they have a level of independence that comes out from the political pressure and the media and where they can do a very solid job that can achieve what we're looking for. In Paraguay, we've been working through a train the trainer course and we've been trying for all government officers although there's still a handful that they have a level of experience and knowledge that is important. And through a training system, we have a virtual training system that's called Nyandederi in Guarani, where they can register, take the courses uh, from the competent areas because we're talking about the large taxpayers audit, uh, tax policy collection, and all of them are seeing that this tool is assisting to be able to achieve this in the countries that have the most experience and to increase collection. And that's why we're moving in this direction. The advantage that we have is that we got, because we got there last, we're bringing the best of all experiences. In some cases, learn about the errors uh, some other people made, um, not to make the same mistakes again. And I think it, it's fundamental. Getting there late sometimes has some benefits in this perspective. So we're working on changing the organic structure because uh, international tax policy is not only exchanging information, but we're also talking about other points such as implementing transfer pricing, um, double taxation agreements. Uh, since last year, where we uh, approved the Convention for Mutual Assistance, and I think consolidating the teams and with the assistance from everybody will be fundamental. And I believe it's very important. And what the, social, the civil society representative just said, Paraguay after 27 years, and with this I'm done, went through a tax reform process where we created a technical commission where not only the technicians themselves participated, but the social sector, the civil sector, the association of business people, accountants, attorneys, all of us together worked on this technical committee and we heard everyone. In less than a year, a law was passed, a, a tax a reform and this is only achieved by generating trust in the institution. And tax administration has to generate this confidence to be able to achieve the objectives. So I just wanted to say this as a positive experience by exchanging ideas between various sectors. 
Thank you, Oscar. The experience of Paraguay in this regard is very relevant. What are the roads that we should set ourselves to to move forward in this topic? Agnes, from this perspective, the role of training and cooperation within everything we've shared in this meeting is fundamental from what we're seeing. How does the Global Forum and the Secretariat see the role or the strategy of cooperation foreseen for member countries in Latin America? Yes, as has been mentioned, training is key. And the Secretariat hasn't developed, has developed the new strategy that we started implementing last year. This strategy has been the result of over 10 years of experience with the countries in which we, we've uh, had lessons learned. We've tried to understand uh, the needs of the countries and approach the particular needs of each country. This training strategy is based on three pillars that are essential to achieve effective change. And this strategy has been applied with countries in the region, Paraguay, Peru, Ecuador, and we're currently implementing this strategy with other countries in the region. This strategy, like I say, has three pillars. The first one is awareness raising and approach. Awareness implies getting the commitment from authorities in the countries and decision makers to get their commitment with the exchange of information because without this commitment, we won't be able to uh, perform all of the major reforms that should be carried out from an organizational structural perspective. Another way in which the Secretariat of the Global Forum carries out this awareness and approach is by uh, seeking fiscal transparency in bilateral uh, activities. An example of the events in which we communicate and raise awareness is the meetings of the Punta del Este Declaration. And another example is the General Assembly of CIA. These are powerful fora where we communicate and uh, clarify questions from countries. Another way in which we approach and raise awareness is through interaction and collaboration with civil organizations, researchers that work very closely in the region and then uh, emblematic examples we have today, Jorge Coronado from La Ciudad, that uh, we, also, we will soon have the Network for Fiscal Justice. And this is the second pillar, which is the construction of knowledge and skills. In this pillar, what we do is prepare the um, uh, scopes so the countries have general knowledge and then we go to more customized technical assistance. The Secretariat places special emphasis on training in Spanish to be able to reach our target audience in the region. This assistance is provided through standardized tools. For example, we've published manuals, toolkits, electronic learning tools, monitoring tools. And the idea is that countries use these standardized tools to better understand the key concepts of the standards. And once clear knowledge is derived from the standards, the Secretariat can move to the next step which is more personalized assistance adapted to the needs of the countries. And this second pillar, we can mention examples of manuals recently published together with the regional partners. And I can 
mentioned the manual of the final beneficiary that developed with the ITP. And last week we published the version in Spanish. And we will soon publish the version in Spanish of the model manual for the a unit of exchange of information that we're developing together with the World Bank. For the Secretariat, it's very important to develop knowledge through training sessions and seminars. In the context of the pandemic, was an opportunity to reach larger audiences through virtual seminars. The results we've achieved are impressive. In 2020 and 21, we were able to train 1,600 officers from uh, Latin American administrations through virtual yeah. seminars. And the third pillar of our training strategy is effective use and implementation. And this is what follows. Uh, and it's personalized attention. And it's based on the understanding of the secretariat that every country has specific needs. And that's why technical assistance should be adapted to the needs of the country. In this strategy for capacity building the Global Forum has, I can mention a capacity building program regarding the automatic exchange of information. And it has been a modular approach. Each one has specific objectives countries need to look at. And if the objective of the module is not met, uh, we can move to the next one. The strategy has proven to be successful. And we have the examples mentioned before, like Peru and Ecuador. And finally, as has been mentioned by Oscar Orway, the Secretariat expects to create sustainable capacities. And we've implemented the program Train the Trainer. We recently launched it for Latin America. And this program is taught in Spanish. It has a duration of one year. And it has a new approach for capacity building that seeks for these uh, capacities to remain in time. The way this program works is that, first of all, tax administrations appoint local experts. And these local experts are trained intensively by the Secretariat of the Global Forum, both at a technical level in the standards, as well as soft skills. Because the idea is that at the end of this program, experts carry out local workshops within their own tax administrations. And as Saida Manata mentioned in her presentation on the report of fiscal transparency, we expect to report successful results next year. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes. I think the topic that you just mentioned is very important in terms of the fact that we're in a tropical country of the tropicalization of training and the various instruments that you issue so that the effectiveness of the assistance that you provide is maximized in the assimilation by each one of the persons that work in the administration. And in this way, we can move forward in this subject matter. In this regard, Gonzalo, what are, from the perspective of SIAD as a body that supports us relentlessly in tax matters, what are the lessons SIAD can share with the members in overcoming the challenges represented by the exchange of information. I think there's an important element in the sense that the exchange of information allows us to access information between administrations that is not public. Yet has helped us with DIP, which is a, tool, a very valuable tool, 
regarding the availability of public information, but in regards to this other area, what are the main challenges you foresee? Thank you. Transparency and exchange of information is something by nature of cooperation. It's not only the use of exchanges, but the uh, but to build capacities. Uh, ad tax administrations would like to uh, help and cooper cooperate among peers because many are interested in sharing with more countries that are developed to build capacity in the region. Now, providing technical assistance to a country, to a tax administration is not easy. Context makes it difficult their unforeseen situations. And I feel that an important topic would be, first of all, to make use of a strategic plan. And within the strategic plan of the tax administration, to consider the exchange of information with a vision of a full cycle from beginning to end. What needs to work for this to be successful? And based on this, to consider the most important pillars that need to be developed. For instance, we won't be successful in the exchange of information if we don't have a team ready to identify international taxation risks. And this is basically through a request of information. The Punta del Este Declaration, I think it offers good support to have an influence on these strategic plans and to work very hard on them, not that they're uh, put away as it often happens with these instruments that are absorbed by the operational needs. The other issue has to do with something that for me is the most difficult thing, which is to deal with decisions that are outside the scope of the competent authority, the final a beneficiary, sometimes it implies coordinating with other state-owned entities, and uh, it comes out from the Ministry of Finance, from the scope of the Ministry of Finance, for instance, the central bank. So tax administration as an important stakeholder, how does it have an influence on these policies with a vision of unique government to achieve these instruments? How does it influence in the creation of a trust registry that the tax administration doesn't create or a company registry that is more efficient, not within the tax administration? And at the end of the day, this has to do with the exchange of information. It's not a tax matter. This has been very difficult for us. And what we're trying to do here, and we've worked with different countries to encourage control capacity of companies in the mining sector. And we're working with, a, with an initiative called INCF, we call the Mining uh, Department, Secretariat of Energy, and projects flow better. And I think we need to work better. We need to call all of the stakeholders and carry out technical assistance where they're all engaged and that we understand what we're doing. Otherwise, many projects, uh, we've worked on final beneficiaries that have been very good and they're still waiting to be used. And this has its, the complexity to it because it, there are many ways of going about it. This provides flexibility, but complicates because many people ask themselves, how do I go about it? Where do we start? So this is an important issue. And then awareness. And I call this uh, external awareness. How do we receive this support from the tax administration of the Ministry of Finance to raise awareness from their own area to other government institutions horizontally? The other issue is culture. And this is internal awareness. How do we raise awareness so that we make better use of these tools and to detect non-tax illegal um, transactions that require informing other authorities. And I think this is very complex and this will be something we need to systematize with internal procedures to make officers 
report the indications that there's a case that is not tax related. And it's also complicated because illegal matters not always tax. So an auditor comes with a very interesting case that may provide millions in collection, but it's money laundering and corruption. So this is no longer a tax collection and misses the indicator. This has to do with competencies that need to be managed. International coordination is also important. If there is a chance to have a joint audit, we should do so. ICAP is an international cooperation tool that is not within the reach of everybody because it requires a risk system. But there's opportunity for cooperation and active collection is a gold opportunity to add risk and to generate a risk perception among tax players. Investing is also something that I mentioned earlier, but an investing on people I believe is important is to have a second line prepared in the case, as it was mentioned, that leave or uh, the paper leave. Technical knowledge is not turnkey. The one that gives sustainability are the countries. Countries always have a local counterparty. We only put in the missing part of the puzzle. So we need to create a sustainability strategy in terms of the technical assistance that we provide. And the other topic that I mentioned is capacity for working with technical assistance. So we ask if this will take away time, how can we help to make decisions, to raise awareness internally or externally, to plan, to build? And what does building mean? The country from carries on the technical assistance or the country reviews and training. Sometimes we propose that is after work hours, not to take away working time. So these are important topics. The regional experience sometimes is not sufficient enough. And this is where idiomatic problems arise. Another issue is that cooperation has a limit. Administrations say, I want to cooperate. I love it, but I have only a three-person team. How can I make it available to this other country, this project, 10 hours? today it's impossible so what we try to do at CIAD is to try to look at, identify consultants that work full-time in consultancy that can be fully devoted to the project and try to match them with the peer support to make transcendental decisions or replicate some models this is another topic that is sometimes a bottleneck but not only on this matter but also matters related to VEPs and other tax matters Thank you very much, Gonzalo. Your contribution has been very valuable in terms of continuity with the developing the capacities that are so relevant. The worst enemy that we have in these events is time. I am uh, being told that the next session, one of the panelists is going to join us virtually and it is late in the evening for him. So maybe I have two additional questions, one for Don Jorge and another one for Don Oscar. So I would like to thank you to be very brief to answer your questions so you can share with us this, your opinions. From the point of view of civil society, Mr. Coronel, what are some possible solutions that organizations such as Latin Dad that have a scope that is not so local as working with countries, but working at a regional level, what are possible solutions that can be considered to build uh, the sustainability on these matters, because I believe that the exchange of information shouldn't be something contextualized, but something sustainable. So the tax justice that we all seek is sustainable uh, over time as well. Thank you. I am trying to do it as a Twitter, uh, to give my answer as if I were using Twitter. Thinking about mobilization of internal resources within a context such as the one the planet is facing today with the pandemic impact, our armed conflict in Europe poses a great challenge. And in fact, it makes the issue of tax transparency to become a fundamentally urgent aspect. I believe that it is necessary and we are noticing our agenda of topics the need to achieve not just a report country by country by country 
report of a few jurisdictions because we are, have to pay attention to a phenomenon that in many large contributors, national large contributors are replicating the models of the multinationals. So they have undertaken many of these abusive practices. So this country by country report should not just focused on the multinational organizations, but also on large groups, especially in Latin America, by prioritizing the safeguarding of uh, digital security. Our country is undergoing a very difficult situation in terms of cyber attacks. The protection of account, the taxpayer account information is at the core, and especially the information that is managed by government organizations. I believe that we have to overcome many barriers to be published the uh, statistics of the CRS, especially everything that has to do with the banking secrecy and countries such as Switzerland or the US that although they are exchanging information, they do it in a very selective manner. And there are many, a lot of our economic activities in those jurisdictions also to reduce time to be able to have to undertake a company audits, improve the access standards to the beneficial owner registers. From civil society, we have been proposing for these registers to become public. We are still far from achieving it. Have access to information of the tax plans of the large multinational companies to have a to better map the potential actions. And something that we have also been proposing and that has been acquiring more and more relevance is to reinforce measures specifically on what we can do to make their wealth, the great wealth, pay taxes. And within in the pandemic, we have seen this clearly expressed. We have advanced in collecting information, but there is still a lot of personal wealth that continues hidden in offshore centers. So this is why we are adding the initiative of increase to create a global register of uh, wealth assets to be able to make more transparent all of this. We also need to strengthen progressive tax reforms, especially in Latin America. And finally, we have to continue strengthening the efforts and the fight against a fiscal fraud and financial flows. And in our region to enhance the fight against opacity that is eroding all of our resources that are available. So here we have a central demand, which is to eradicate the tax havens and to expand even the list that countries are keeping of tax havens that is more and more restricted and become more and more restrictive. And we also call to continue enhancing, reinforcing the work of our tax administrations, the control organisms, the promotion of articulated regional work that guarantees, uh, effectively guarantees success in these actions and activities. In other words, we believe that progress, ha positive progress has been made, but there is still a lot to be done. And with, with cooperation, with cooperation among governmental entities, the civil society and multilateral organizations to create a important alliance that can do away with the tax capacity that would guarantee that the expiration of meeting the development goals through the mobilization of internal resources actually has a financial substance uh, when taxation plays a role that we all seek to get in our countries. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Coronado. In this sense of sustainability, uh, Mr. Orwe mentioned a little bit about as to what Paraguay has been doing, but now that you, the multilateral declaration has been signed and you have increased significantly the exchange of information, can you please tell us very quickly what the Paraguay's plans are to build, continue building capacity that guarantees sustainability in terms of the exchange of information. Yes, thank you, Carlos. I am going to be very brief. To continue on this capabilities and human resources, we are going to continue betting on training and providing infrastructure, specific infrastructure from a structural perspective, to call it a name to achieve, to give the international taxation at an, another level to work on all of these topics so we can transfer the knowledge. The work meetings that we will have with all of the areas, I believe is going to be fundamental and it is very important. As Gonzalo was saying earlier, are, how are we going to pay for all of this? And it can only be financed in our law. We, we included that a percentage of the tax collection will be kept by the taxation authority property. 5% to be specific every month is kept by the tax authority. And so this will grant, give us the resources to be able to invest in technology and infrastructure. So I believe that the main challenge that we will have or what we'll be focusing on as part of our plan is to consolidate the human resources, the organizational structure, and the ongoing review and monitoring of all exchange of information procedures and betting on technology for automatic exchange of information. I think that this is also going to be very important as to how technology is to, going to help us to achieve this automatic exchange and especially not just for to be transparent, but also to secure the information and reserving the information that ultimately is what we need as an organization to build trust and transparency and security and in the work that we are doing. So I will not to take too long. So thank you very much. Thank you very much to all our panelists in this conversation. I would like just to uh, some closing remarks for this session to stress uh, some four uh, general elements that I have noticed. First is the understanding and the importance of tax administration and political authorizations in countries to understand the importance of the exchange of information as a tool that is also important to fight against fraud and evasion. Based on this understanding, the possibility of building capacities by the administrations and the authorities that can translate first into the provision of the necessary resources to be able to advance and strengthen these capacities, the incorporation of the planning schemes of the administrations of spaces for opportunities for training that are so necessary to be able to understand the scope and the reach that this could have within the different control processes that the administrations do in terms of exchange of information and also the incorporation of this information and the analysis of this information in risk management process to comply with, uh, for tax compliance that each administration has to implement for them to be able to do management based on the different treatments that they have available for planning processes. In this sense, I believe that it is important and fundamental to get support of international organizations for the purpose of the administration to be able to have the elements and tools that are basic to visualize the improvements that they have to undertake at an administrative level. And from the tax point of view, the support that can be provided to each country 
for them to move forward in the understanding of the importance of the legal reforms that are necessary to be able to adjust and adapt the country's legislation to the international standards on this subject matter. And this, of course, requires the motivation of the intralegal regulations. The support of organizations such as IAT, OECD, through the Global Forum, the IDB, and the International Monetary Fund are fundamental for the building of these capacities for the design of the tax policies of each country. And finally, the results. Administrations also live based on results, and so the importance of how the exchange in its different modes have to achieve the metrics and results that are expected from each administration. So this is important, it needs to be quantified. And as part of the plans, this quantification requires indicators to be able to comply with the mandate that society gives us to be a fairer society, a more just society in terms of tax justice. Thank you very much for the opportunity that you have given to us to talk about these topics. And I would like to give the floor to our chair so we can continue. Thank you very much, Don Carlos, for your support as moderator. I would also like to thank the panelists for their contributions and also for the vision that they have shared with us to continue with this discussion. I would just keep a couple of conclusions for later on because of time constraints. So I would like to thank you once again. Uh, so we move on to the next session. Nos corresponde. We now have the panel debate on the create on building effective beneficial ownership frameworks in Latin America. Countries in Latin America are advancing the implementation of the beneficial ownership standard. In this session, we will be discussing these advances, which is a key topic, and we will be presenting the manner published by the Global Forum and the American Development Bank on different approaches available to jurisdictions for them to ensure the availability of beneficial ownership information. I have the pleasure of introducing Mr. Will Fitchiburn, who is a senior reporter in the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, who is going to join us for sure. And I thank him for waiting, even though we know that it must be very late at night where he is. Please go ahead, Mr. Fitzgibbon. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for inviting me to moderate this event. My name is Will Fitzgibbon. I'm a senior journalist with the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, best known as ICIJ. Uh, for those of you in the audience, don't worry. My goal today is not to expose any of your secret bank accounts or British Virgin Islands companies. Uh, my goal today is to facilitate an important and interesting discussion about beneficial ownership and why this is so important. In some ways, I wouldn't have had a job at ICIJ for the past seven years if we were in a better place when it came to global transparency. Every ICIJ project from the Panama Papers to the Pandora Papers has involved findings and key takeaways about beneficial ownership around the world, where it works, where it doesn't, steps that are still to be taken to improve. In that regard, I'm very happy to be joined today by a number of experts from across the region. We have with us Mr. Roberto Di Michele, the Chief of Innovation in Citizen Services at the IDB. We have Mr. Tom Nalen, Head of Risk and the Policy Unit at FATAF. Ms. Yara Esquivel, who I follow on Twitter and who is a Senior Financial Sector Specialist at the World Bank Group. Mr. Lisandro Junco Rivera, the Director General of Diane, and Mr. Andres Noble, a lead researcher at TJN. Now, given the late time in Paris from where Mr. Nalen joins us, we're going to dive straight into an informal conversation with him, as we will with others, about the recently adopted revisions to the FATF recommendations, in particular, Recommendation 24 about uh, beneficial ownership, for example. And Tom, I hope you can hear me. 
Uh, I wanted to start with you, and I wondered if you could just give us a nice, clean introduction to what these revisions mean and how you see them better strengthening uh, transparency globally. Thanks, and, and thank you very much for moving me up. It's still light here in Paris, in case you can see it, so things aren't that bad. Um, but it would be better to be there in person. Um, I was going to start by saying basically why we started revising the FATF standards, because um, it takes a lot to change an international standard. There has to be quite a lot of momentum before these things get reopened. Um, if anything, I'll begin with feedback to ICIJ. The journalism actually moved the dial on this issue. Uh, there are probably three reasons why we opened the standard, and the first of them is um, the lessons that we've taken from the Panama Papers, the Pandora Papers, Una Oil, and a series of other uh, major leaks of documents that have exposed not just how uh, bad most countries are at preventing this sort of misuse, but the diverse ways in which companies are used as the key method for laundering money, financing terrorism, evading tax, uh, avoiding sanctions, performing and hiding the proceeds of corruption, manipulating markets, um, and the industrial scale of the abuse made this was something that was unavoidable for us. Um, the second aspect of this that led us to revise it was our mutual evaluations. We, like the Global Forum, we go and do in-depth evaluations of all countries on a quite long cycle, I think about 10 years. We look at their technical compliance with the rules, but we also look at how effective they are. And the results of those evaluations showed us that two problems, really. First was that people aren't implementing the rules well enough. Um, technical compliance wasn't great. Um, and it's easy to say this is a problem for countries. Um, you need to implement the rules better. But what we found out that's not quite true. Um, the rules themselves weren't adequate. Even in the countries which were implementing them properly, they were failing to prevent the widespread abuse of companies to, to hide illicit actions and to conceal assets. So both implementation and the rules needed to be fixed. Um, and simply the world had moved on. Uh, we created the beneficial ownership rules in 2003. It's 19 years later, and we've seen a lot more of what works. Um, countries have built registries, and we can learn from their experience of that. Um, so all of those pointed us towards revising the standards and that being a timely thing to do. Uh, we started two years ago at the same time that COVID emerged. Um, and frankly, COVID was more fun than trying to untangle this network of obligations and laws. Uh, but we finished in February this year with what looks like a major strengthening of the standards. Um, and I was going to give a very quick flavor of the main changes. They're all out there in depth, um, and we can talk about them later. The big things are we have a risk-based approach now for countries to understand and mitigate the risks that they face. Um, that's worth flagging up because it's open-ended. If your risks are bigger than other countries, uh, then you will be expected to take more action uh, because you need to do enough rather than just comply with the letter of the law. Um, and that includes the risk of foreign created legal persons as well as domestic ones. Uh, it isn't an excuse to say this company wasn't created here, so we let it trade with impunity and we don't care who's hiding behind it. Um, it includes a multi-pronged approach. We've heard a lot in the previous sessions about that. We've embedded this in the standards. So the company itself has to have the information. There has to be a beneficial ownership registry or an alternative to that, and supplementary measures where they're needed. Um, and BO registries are very flexible. Um, a lot of countries, the tax administration is very much the right place to do that, but it could be the company's registry, it could be the financial intelligence unit, or it could be a network of different provincial administrations. There's a lot of scope to embed this in countries' administrations, how they feel uh, is most efficient and most appropriate. Um, we then have new requirements to have information that's adequate, accurate, and up-to-date. It means verifying the beneficial owner. 
Um, and if the document says Mickey Mouse, um, you'd better be having uh, the Disney Corporation be the company that's got that um, as its true beneficial owner. Um, and updating information within a month of changes. Um, these sound very simple things, but they haven't been written into the standards before, and they're quite a big step forward. Um, we have a few provisions around access to the information, and we've also got new controls on the most widely abused mechanisms, bearer shares um, and nominee arrangements. For nominees, it's tighter controls. Uh, for bearer shares, it's an absolute prohibition on issuing new bearer shares. Um, they're a mechanism that was maybe useful in the 19th century, but that was a long time ago. And uh, those that already exist need to be controlled, but there's no reason to be issuing more. Um, so it's a significant strengthening overall, but adopting the standards is just the first step. Thanks, Tom. And just to follow up there, if I could briefly, for, for the Latin American audience uh, with us today, are there any main areas that you think should be subject to special attention globally or more particularly regionally? There's a lot for them to do. Um, and actually the real work starts once this comes down to national administration. Um, a lot of countries are going to have to pass new laws or at the very least introduce new regulations in order to make all of these standards take effect. Um, it's going to need governments to maybe create new agencies or at least assign responsibility for being a BO registry to an existing agency. And they'll need the staff, the technology, the capacity to do all of that. So the job within governments is already quite big. Um, they're going to have to be joined up across governments as well, because making beneficial ownership registries work means enlisting tax authorities, financial intelligence units, companies, registries, financial supervisors to all exchange information domestically and within governments in an efficient way so that they can all follow up their legitimate need to identify beneficial owners. Um, and then once you get outside government, there's another big task to do, which is getting the relevant bits of the industry and private sector to perform their obligations. Uh, financial institutions are already working on beneficial ownership but they're going to have a different role, for example, on identifying discrepancies between what their customers tell them and what's recorded in the registry. Um, and then the biggest job of all, in my mind, is something that's not part of our recommendation 24 at all. It's supervising the gatekeepers. Um, they're, if left unsupervised, a weak link in this whole system. Um, and we've seen from all of the media revelations that Badly regulated lawyers can find loopholes in these things, can stand in as nominees, um, can create very impenetrable networks of companies. We need all of the countries in Latin America and globally to take seriously their role of supervising those gatekeeper professions, lawyers, accountants, trust and company service providers. And if that doesn't happen, and the changes we've made on beneficial ownership won't lead to a real change on the ground in terms of how difficult it is to conceal illicit finance or evade tax. Thanks, Tom. Very much appreciate you joining us from Paris and the growing late hour there. Uh, we're going to let you go now and then move on to uh, Roberto de Michele from the IDB. As a reporter who worked on the papers, what Tom was talking about was incredibly important. I still remember the case of the bank in Switzerland that filled in a beneficial ownership form that ticked a box saying that the uh, that uh, a good friend of Vladimir Putin in Russia wasn't a beneficial owner, for example, uh, which was pretty obvious to check uh, with a simple Google search. So clearly the practicalities of things remain a challenge. Something that might help address those challenges uh, is the IDB's a uh, recent toolkit, Building Effective Beneficial Ownership Frameworks, that talks a lot about all of the different approaches to beneficial ownership information. Uh, and I want to bring uh, Roberto onto the microphone now to really ask him about the benefits of a multi-pronged approach. We've heard a lot about it already today, but in a Latin American context in particular, take us through why this multi-pronged approach uh, is so helpful. Um. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. If you don't mind, I'm going to switch to Spanish. Um, 
I think you, you, is that okay? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, bueno. Thank you very much. First, thanks to the Global Forum and the government of Costa Rica. It is really a pleasure for us on behalf of the IDB to be here finally in person after so long. And also to thank the GAFI and the Global Forum. We are observers in these two organizations. And uh, a little bit of, of deviation because I think it's important to answer your question is how, how did we get here? And basically as many other things in life, it has been almost a fortuitous thing. A colleague of mine from the tax division who worked on tax transparency met with me in a bank where I work on money laundering. And he said, I think that we have to talk about, and this was eight years ago because the global forum has this demand and Gaffey has this other demand. And then we need to try to reduce the transaction cost and to have a shared approach as possible. Because in this way, countries which are the true destina destinations of these policies will uh, be able to address or implement these policies more effectively. So this is how we started with this internal effort to support countries so that this could become not just a tax issue but, or a tax matter or a preventing mon money loitering or anti-corruption, but also as much as possible, as the colleagues from the CIAD said in the previous panel, to involve everyone at, at the same time. Respecto de por qué un, 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 un enfoque como el que se propone en el manual parecería ser el más adecuado, es porque coincidimos con la idea de que debemos evitar de que haya un esquema de una medida igual para todos. ¿Por qué es esto? Porque cada país tiene sus particularidades en materia de diseño institucional, de evolución de sus instituciones. Como se dijo en el panel anterior, este no es solamente un problema de adoptar reglas o estándares, y lo acaba de decir Tom recién, que sea consistente técnicamente con el estándar GAFI o con el estándar OCTE. Es un tema un poco más complicado que eso, en particular para los países de América Latina, de tradición continental, que estamos a más acostumbrados a que nos den prescripciones legales. ¿Qué está permitido y qué está prohibido? Cuando nos describen una función, como hace el estándar, usted haga lo que quiera, pero produzca este resultado funcional, la gente se empieza a preocupar y confundir. Quiere, quiere un poquito más de estructura, un poco más de directiva. Y, y sinceramente creo que debemos tratar de aprovechar estratégicamente la ventaja que nos da el estándar de GAF, porque creo que nos permite a países because I believe it allows countries like us that have different institutional development to take advantage of the skills that we have to improve them. And it's true, and I agree, that a non-smaller part of this is regulatory. But it was mentioned in the previous panels, two or three additional things that help to um, answer why this is more appropriate. The second thing has to do with interinstitutional coordination. It seems obvious, but it's not that state organizations that are in charge of a policy that have overlapping areas that are actually coordinated. This doesn't happen randomly. In many countries, this requires signing agreements, MOUs, and in particular, when this exchange touches on information that legally is sensitive. So if one puts her, ourselves in the shoes of a tax auditor or financial intelligence, you have to think a few times before somebody tells you, you need to have an interoperable system that you will be automatically sharing. It's logical to understand that this may bring questions so the second point is interinstitutional cooperation uh, that doesn't come out directly from standard 24. But if you read the GAFI standards carefully, you'll find it. You're going to find standard number two. That's the second point. The third point is technology can help us tremendously. But we also need to be careful because it's... Uh, it's not error free and the design adopted has to be very deliberate, very well thought out. 
that gets the highest benefit possible for the exchange of information with the highest degree of protection to avoid gaps. And the fourth element that I'd like to mention to your question is what has been mentioned regarding the personal capacities and human resources. Agnes, in the previous panel, mentioned a large number of resources available. I'm not going to repeat them. And I'd like to add a couple more that I think are more effective and appropriate. For instance, the Academia of OECD of Financial Crimes. Every time a country of the IDP wants the bank to fund the participation of the academia that offers great courses where some of these matters are dealt with, we make sure participants come from at least three agencies, financial uh, in intelligence, uh, the tax authority, and a government body. Because it's very important that even from the perspective of training, we can guarantee that people begin looking at this problem that is systemic, that is complex, from the various perspectives. So the long answer to your question is that this approach will provide more flexibility to find the right answer for every country and achieve what has been mentioned before, not only make sure there's technical compliance, but also to make sure to the extent possible to have more effectiveness in the least amount of time possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that was a very helpful summary of the benefits of such an approach and also speaking to the challenges uh, and lessons that the IDB has seen uh, and can offer uh, in this space. So very much appreciated. Uh, Yara Esquivel, we're going to turn to you now uh, at the World Bank Group, uh, another actor in this space of implementing beneficial ownership standards to combat tax evasion and, and financial crimes. I uh, was wondering if you could give us here some overall general thoughts on how the World Bank Group has been viewing the implementation of central registers and these other approaches that we've been hearing about for beneficial ownership. I'm going to be answering in Spanish, just like Roberto, and I hope uh, interpretation is working fine. Well, we've been working for some time now in implementing transparency on financial beneficiaries from two perspectives, fiscal transparency and uh, anti-money laundering and fun financing of terrorism. And the lack of transparency on information uh, beneficial owners is the mother of all sins. Uh, fiscal evasion, corruption, laundering, organized crime, etc. It's a good place where to start. We've been focused on working with uh, FATF in developing the standard, and it's one of the points we've been working on. But we've been also expanding our work in the area of the national risk assessment to include risk of abuse of companies, risks of abuse of uh, service providers, such as uh, lawyers, the importance of understanding very well how these uh, gatekeepers function, and then how to implement this risk-based approach when looking at beneficial owners. We've been working with countries in the technical compliance and drafting of laws, uh, bylaws, etc. But we've been also working on the implementation of the records of beneficial owners. I have to confess that originally, when countries started to implement registers from the area of the World Bank, we have worried that some service providers said they were really concerned that to date they had been doing the due diligence of their customers that they thought was very careful. And when records of uh, beneficial owners started to be registered, we were going to have repositories of information in which the state will uh, somehow bless the information and say everything was fine and obliged entities were going to stop doing their work in due diligence. So how could we face this? Uh, at the beginning, 
we were not behind the idea of the records. However, as we've seen and has how they've been implemented, one of the main issues that has come up, at least from a perspective, and we've been pushing it a lot, and we've been very happy to see is verification of information with a risk-based approach. So again, we're back to what we mentioned, and the importance that the AFCF standards with a risk-based approach the support has also sought to how to make countries implement uh, this more uh, appropriately to maximize the resources they have and to we don't want them to verify the whole universe, but only those companies or service providers that have an increased risk. So in this sense, we feel that the ideal uh, thing would be for them to be public because civil society people like you uh, practice this control because it's public, it would be ideal. I also understand that because of our history in Latin America, people are reluctant to, to make this public. So in this regard, what remains is that authorities take the next step to verify the information that is being incorporated in the records and that they supervise uh, service providers so that they can provide the service that is necessary in terms of the information with the beneficial owner. I believe this is what we've been looking at. Latin America is the region after Europe that has the highest number of beneficial owners. I have a dream. And although we're not making information be public at this moment, that at least we can get to a moment where information can be exchanged between the various countries in Latin America, more or less like uh, this platform bodies that is being considered in Europe so that we can have this effective, effect, efficient exchange of information so that we can compare information because what we've seen in certain countries and we'll talk about this later but when we have this cross control with databases everything works well uh, so long as we're contained in the country but once we have a beneficial owner a company abroad this is where it becomes tricky so if we could exchange this information i think this would be the sweet spot but that's more or less where we're heading at, focusing on risk and making sure that it's not technical compliance, but that it has effective implementation to provide good supervision. Thank you. I wanted to follow up because the World Bank is the queen of uh, technology and technological and technical assistance in some ways. Uh, are there lessons that the World Bank Group can share with uh, with other countries and those present about some of the technological challenges that exist in this space and maybe how the bankers thought to overcome some of them in the immediate term or longer term? I love the question because we've been working on these issues around technology. Uh, the World Bank has a project with machine learning IA is a project that is guaranteed that it'll be approved. People are really interested in these topics. We believe there's a lot of room in the transparency of beneficial owners to use technology, but we need to learn to crawl before we walk. And this is something we've seen where the in countries where the capacity uh, faces more challenges. We need to set up these blocks and I believe we need to begin by thinking, I just mentioned cross control of information. So it's having good databases for starters, good databases in all of the agencies um, that the information managed by WIF can be compared against the information with the tax authority the information in the commercial registry, all of this is very important to be done automatically. It will always be necessary when we're thinking about verification, when we get to certain red flags, that we have humans behind the technological uh, the, uh, apparatus so that they can do a more detailed analysis. I don't think a machine can do this, but 
we have the possibility of developing algorithms that allow us to identify these red flags. For instance, at this moment, we have a project in Eastern Africa that I'm leading. Uh, my colleague, Anna, that could be here today, and we're leading a project in Eastern Africa where precisely what we're doing is looking at the databases of a fiscal agency. And I won't get into a lot of detail because it, they're data scientists, but they're developing algorithms that would allow them to identify red flags of corruption on the information being handled within these databases. And this information can be shared to the research area of this agency so that they can carry out an investigation. So for instance, this is an example of what can be achieved with technology. When we go to mining the data, convert it into intelligence to get into investigation that renders results. I don't like to support myself so much on technology. And it's important to have human beings behind that are managing things, but it's important for us to begin to go beyond and see where we can get. For several years, we were talking about how we were going to get data. Now we have decades of data, mostly UIFs, and sometimes we don't know how to do with so much information. We need to mine it and we need to begin using everything technology allows us to to support these investigations and support our work with all the, these data. And we can get to a point where all these databases will open up and we can get information that is uh, true, uh, useful for investigation. Thank you, Yara. Sounds like your job is very similar to mine, a combination of data and human beings. Uh, and I think this is one of the only places in the world where you can have 150 people in one room being just excited about spreadsheets uh, as you are. Uh, Thank you very much for that. We've heard from a few people speaking at the international and the regional level, and it's interesting now to move to a specific country example in Colombia. I remember after the Panama Papers, there was a study by academics at the University of Berkeley who said that beneficial ownership information from the Panama Papers helped Diane uh, double the collection of taxes uh, thanks to beneficial ownership information being out there. So it's a perfect selection and perfect country to talk about their experience now. Uh, Mr. Junko Rivera, would love to hear from you. Tell us a little bit about Colombia's experience with its register of beneficial owners, uh, why that choice was made, and your assessment so far of how it's been going in practice. Thank you, Will, and we're back in Spanish. Unquestionably, Colombia has generated a multi-pronged approach according to the Joint Manual of the Global Forum and the IDP, applying this agreement that we have with the recommendation of Action 24 and 25 of FATF, and we've created a lot of regulation that has allowed us to go beyond, given the specificities of Colombia. A multiple-pronged approach is concentrating of potentiating our struggle against five practices that are hideous and criminal. One of them is asset laundering, funding, financing to terrorism, corruption, tax evasion. And a fifth one that we haven't discussed is contraband that damages our countries. And this means that every time we need to focus our practices of exchange of information and collecting information to more crimes. Tom mentioned a while ago, the manipulation of mar markets or market rigging. And uh, we're at a new level of what we can use with the information of fi financial beneficiaries. Colombia adopting this approach by using different criteria and creating a single uh, a beneficial owner record for companies and also for those entities that are, are not uh, incorporated as a company. And this system of structure without um, a company capacity allows us to go to these activities that seem as if they were offshore companies that are hardly detected. And this has generated great results. 
and leads us to having another concept that I haven't heard much, which is due diligence. Due diligence that we need to practice because this concept of beneficial owner that we see in this manual is not only for tax authorities, but also for those controlling companies, uh, financial control that do research of criminal liability, fiscal disciplinary liability. In other words, we need to implement uh, the use of these data so that all state institutions, as in the case of Colombia, can take advantage of it. Colombia at this moment in the tax administration is the one managing this central record for a series of reasons. Uh, other institutions have other authorities in Colombia. We agreed it was in the tax authority for a series of reasons. The first one is the legal reserve. Colombia protects this data before any third party that would like to have access to them that don't have their competencies. Secondly, technological uh, protection. And I would like to sol become um, sol with solidarity to the hacking the Costa Rican government has suffered. Colombia, the tax administration, just this year, we've had 3,300 cyber attacks. And we haven't been able to be hacked, but they did hack the National Statistics Department. And this is a reality that at this moment, when we talk about data, uh, financial owners is at risk because they can be cyber attacking us with different purposes. And I think it's important to raise the flag so that multilateral bodies and additionally, this group of countries uh, that is here can continue combating these cyber attacks that damage us so much. Um, before the issue of the identification system of structures without a legal identification, it's important to remember that they need to have tax identification records. So we're gonna see in the independent uh, equities uh, trusts collective portfolios and different instruments that we only see in literature that are real and that erode our taxable basis that transfer benefits with a tax administration number, with a name and who the beneficial owners are. Finally, I'd like to say that the experience of Colombia has been very good. We've received training from the OECD And we've received training from AFATF, and we've invested $400,000 to be able to implement our single user beneficial uh, owners and entities that are unincorporated, and that has given great results. As Colombia, we can say we're talking about meeting expectations. We started this year in January 2022 and consolidates a large amount of data we're taking advantage of in order to generate transparency, collection, and combat the practices I mentioned a while ago. Thank you, Lissandra. I'm going to follow up with you too. Um, uh, Tom was speaking before about the important, importance of monitoring and compliance. How does Diane and how does Colombia ensure that Mickey Mouse is not listed as the beneficial owner uh, of a company in Colombia? How do you ensure that compliance and accurate information is the hallmark of your systems? El, el principal. The main adjective we need to use to be able to comply with these regulatory measures that we have is training. I believe that before talking about a sanction, we need to train not only those that are obliged, but business associations where, there, where we have these groups of obliged companies as well as government officers so that they can comply with the due diligence. How have we done these training sessions throughout the pandemic? Clearly using social media, uh, but through different channels, uh, online training, manuals. This is an example that will be very useful in Colombia to continue replicating what they need to do. And obviously generating subjective risk to be able to say that the information we're getting 
of uh, beneficial owners can be exchanged and that they can even make comparisons of information, not only with other countries, but with the, our, our own databases that we have in uh, IAN and other government entities to understand that we can exchange information with other countries, but also creating the KYC, the know your customer, know your citizen, to know who the good guys are and quickly detect the bad guys, generating what we're all countries are after, which is automatic flags for these inconsistencies in the presentation of information. And also very, uh, doing random investigation, as you mentioned, Will, and machine learning, uh, as mentioned by Yara, using data analytics in order to detect uh, poor practices. And questionably, I believe the road to follow is to take advantage of this information for the benefit of our countries and to exchange international information as well. Thank you, Alessandra. Time for our next uh, panelist, Mr. Andres Noble from the Tax Justice Network, uh, uh, or as I like to call him, the king of trust uh, information. I, uh, Andres will either love seeing me again or hate seeing me again because I bothered him so much during the Pandora Papers um, as I tried to work out why so many Latin Americans had been setting up trusts in South Dakota and Wyoming and places like that recently. So it's nice to see you, Andres. Uh, we've been hearing lots about uh, things that are happening, uh, some optimism, some causes from, from, for concern perhaps, and obviously your work with the state of the beneficial ownership around the world is for someone like me a key document to understand how many steps have been taken forward and how many steps have been taken backwards. wondered if overall in a Latin American context you could perhaps speak to some of the room for, room for improvement still. What could be strengthened when it comes to beneficial ownership? Thank you, Will, for your words, and thank you for the invitation. Latin America, as has been mentioned, has moved a lot. Uh, after Europe is the region, according to our analysis, that has more records in beneficial ownership, or at least laws, that begin to require beneficial owners to be informed to a government authority. Now, establishing a record is not enough because you need verification as well. At the same time, establishing a record or law, it's not enough so long as it has legal gaps. There are some countries in Latin America, although 10 have these records, only cover large taxpayers, but not all companies. Other countries establish a record or have a law, but only cover capital companies, but not uh, partnerships or uh, uh, private companies and not all trust. Uh, another big problem, this is not only in Latin America, actually Latin America is much better than many countries. The records of beneficial owners only covered local companies, any company created locally, but they forget to require foreign companies that may have bank accounts in the country, uh, assets or operations. Um, some are done permanently, but others only focus on the local ones, forgetting about the risk generated by foreign companies that operate in the country. Another point is that we not only cover all of the beneficial owners, sometimes countries only focus on entities they're aware of, local entities, and a trust, for example, and all these instruments that exist have trustees and trustor and beneficiaries, and that's it. But they forget that most of their trusts, most in South Dakota, as we mentioned, have a beneficiary of protectors that is discretional beneficiaries that um, are not so transparent to obtain or recover assets within the trust, even if you know all of the parties in the trust. Another point is that many countries move forward in the record of um, beneficial owners that they forget about the shareholder registry, legal owners. And although this is very important and I support beneficial ownership, if you don't even know the first layer of share owners, it's gonna be very difficult to verify who the beneficial owner is that hides behind these 
layers and something similar happens with shares to the bearer. And what brings your attention is that many countries provide mechanisms in our understanding um, that are not enough because sometimes they allow a lawyer, a bank, or any foreign entity uh, will hold these act shares, shares to the bear, not a government authority. But even if a country prohibits them, they can do only um, locally. And there's no obstacle for a company above a lot. The chain of ownership has issued shares to the bear, and it makes it impossible to know who the beneficial owner is. So there are many mechanisms, and I think Latin America is the one that has moved forward the most after Europe. We still have a uh, room to go, and it's not enough to pass a law, not even to establish a record, but to uh, guarantee that there are no irregularities. Andres, I'm curious to know if a beneficial ownership registry is like, uh, is like a house. And if you had to design your perfect house, what are the features that you would put on your ideal beneficial ownership registry? Good question, but given the time, I think about three main aspects. The first one, the basic, is that there should be no gaps, but that all legal issues are included in the information. But what is the ideal one? It has to do first with access to information, many countries and authorities taking the leaks, such as the Panama Papers, the Pandora Painters, and other issues of the SAJ refuse to publish any information. So some of them give access, fewer local authorities, and that's why they have not an international union. FUIU, so they limit access to this information. And on the other hand, they also limit the obligated subjects. You were talking about compliance, due diligence, and all the stakeholders, not just the authorities. Any bank or attorney can do, or bank can do due diligence, but if they don't have access to the register, they will not be able to do it. And we have fewer sources to be verified that the information is true or not. That's why information not only gives access to the public, but also to the different obligated subjects so that they can help to improve the information that is available in the registers that sometimes that it has been approved when doing the analysis of the information in the UK when in, they were establishing this public registry. Unfortunately, the information had not been verified in many cases. Mickey Mouse's or XXA's or XY were uh, listed as the owners. Finally, as well as in terms of hacking and all of the arguments that used about security, there are countries, not just in Europe, that have already been publishing these registers, but in some cases, in the case of Ecuador, they have a register that is not free according to this, but it's similar standard. So any shareholder, any person with uh, regardless of the chain, and they can get the data and consult it publicly online. Even they have information of Argentinian citizens, including the uh, passport number. So in terms of security, sometimes I believe they, they are prone to hacking, and so it would be better to provide access to public data for the basic information that sometimes by being it, it is already public for most structures in most companies and countries. They have simple structures. Not all of them are going to have the tax havens. So in this case, the shareholder is usually the beneficial owner. And so they sometimes take many records, not registers, not only online, but only anyone who has access to these registers. But as Jara mentioned also, the spontaneous bilateral exchange of information, for instance, in the case of bodies of Latin America, it would facilitate that it has been proposed to resolve issues and problems related to the automatic exchange of information. As many of you know, the US doesn't exchange information at the beneficial owner level, and the CSR doesn't do it either about active entities. So the spontaneous bilateral exchange of, they could improve all of this, as improve this register, how to get these beneficial owners in the United States, it's very hard. And finally, to talk about the last two points about this ideal house. One has to do with verification. I has already been mentioned about crossing data, using big data, uh, identifying the red flags. 
but an asset that sometimes some Latin American has is that there are many registers of beneficial owners that are managed by the tax authorities. There are no one that has better resources than the tax authority, not just because of economic and technological resources, but especially because of the kind of information that they manage. They have the findings, the income findings of the individuals and in the case of Argentina where I live, they have data about credit cards, consumption, uh, real estate, and a lot of information that they have to be able to detect the profile of the people could be used to verify the data or the beneficial owner and start identifying when someone is lying, not just about the benef the information, but uh, much more complex issues. And this eventually, when the information is not just available to any local authority, and after it's verified, it would allow to improve the use and the main things that in which we are advancing much in Spain, so based on the armed conflict in Ukraine, is the sanctions. So in many cases, the beneficial owner is not just knowing who owns the company or the trust, but really the assets, a yacht, a private jet, or some real estate property, to be able to combine all of the information about a register of beneficial owners with the information available in the register of um, cars or real estate could make it possible for authorities to place uh, sanctions in order and to take advantage of all these cross data could be, be a, help them resolve tax evasion cases and could detect corruption in terms of laundering and laundering when someone has some wealth and they cannot justify how they got it with the income that they are be, have been filing. Thank you, Andres. And now we can confidently say that you've been, you've been uh, uh, you have no, you have no excuse uh, if next year you don't want to appear uh, on the, in a, JN report about beneficial ownership as having taken steps backwards. Um, I think we're open to some questions for the audience now, and I'm sure the uh, moderator, moderators and organizers will share some questions with us if they have them. Uh, until we see some of those, we've got a few minutes, and I wanted to go back to uh, Roberto de Michele. Um, and I'm sure this hasn't happened and that everyone's been paying attention, but uh, Roberto, if there was someone in the room who was dreaming of going to the beach uh, instead of attending this session on beneficial ownership. What is the one lesson that the IDB has learned from its experience in providing policy guidance on beneficial ownership? The one lesson that you think uh, attendees should take away from, from the IDB's experience? This is possible. <clears throat> Um, es it is complex. Recently, I was reading the report on cybersecurity gaps in Latin America that was recently published by the IDB. And again, let's be cautious and measured in the analysis of a problem that has many pieces in which the main transparency driver that I should, you shouldn't explain to me those benefits and how it interacts with other drivers. The politics, economy, reforms, this is as important as the technical quality of these reforms. And this is an art, it's not a technical issue. So if I had to say something to the director of a tax authority, such as uh, Lisandro, who, who is here with us, this can be done. It is not our trend using the soccer metaphor, it's really a marathon. It, we have to have good verification. We have to think about all of the elements. Anyone who has run a marathon, you know that the first five kilometers are very different after you go after mile 20. So you have to have the contingency plans to look at all of the pieces and then start working and start implementing it. Two elements that I might believe, Andres, I would like to add to what Andres said to that ideal house that he described, I would work where I would bring the private sector into the conversation and I would also bring the civil society for everyone to know the contents of these reforms. So this would be a reform that the society would understand would bring about collective benefits. And this is a public good. And for the public good to advance, it is necessary for everyone to be convinced that the benefits exceed the costs. 
Thank you, Roberto. I appreciate that thoughtful answer, even though I put you on the spot there. There we go. It turns out that everyone involved in beneficial ownership is both an artist and a marathon runner. So that should leave us all feeling pretty uh, optimistic uh, at the end of today. Uh, before we close, I'll throw the floor open to, uh, to Yara, to Andreas, to Lisandro, if there are, and um, Tom, if you're still with us, if, there are, if there's a final comment or thought that they want to lead us with. Yes, fire away. I was listening to all talk about this and I was thinking about the challenges that we have faced as we have been trying to support in the implementation of the registers, especially the legal frameworks, because although it is true that we have effectiveness and what we want to have is to see these registers working properly, everything starts with the legal framework. And it is easier to start from in thinking about the proper legal framework, especially if we are thinking about the exchange of information and the activities then for training activities. One of the main challenges that we have faced is the lack of uniformity in the definition of the beneficial owner. So for me, frankly, it has been very interesting to think about this topic because we have a definition. The FATF has given a uh, definition. So why are we reinventing the wheel with new definitions in each of our countries? And not only that, but we have found countries even in what in, within the same country, according to the law or the regulation of the bylaw, there are different definitions of who the beneficial owner is in, within the country. So I believe that if there were one thing that I would, a message that I would like to get across is for us to really to standardize that definition of beneficial owner, because it's going to help us internally when implementing the registers, but it will also allow us, ex help us externally when doing the exchange of information. There is a tax that I believe there are, there are political right given conditions there could be a simple first step to help each other in improving a better implementation of the standards that having this information about the beneficial owner could be even more useful especially when we are talking within a regional framework there are many common things and many different things as well by standardizing that definition of beneficial owner is a simple tax that could help us a lot in this vision. Thanks, Yara. Thanks, Yara. It's good to know good that it's not only journalists who have different definitions of what a beneficial owner is. Uh, uh, Andres, you're my favorite panelist because you know how to use the raise hand uh, tool. So please leave us with your final thought. My last comment is that uh, aspect of Latin America that shows leadership is the issue of the thresholds and the definition that Jana was mentioning. Many countries, unfortunately, use very high thresholds, more than 25% of voting shares. And so this makes a director of the company instead of the actual beneficial owner. And Latin America has the best cases, not just of... Uh, thresholds of 15, 10, or 5%, but if you have cases in Ecuador and Argentina that definitely don't use such a uh, threshold. Anyone who has a uh, vote in action has to be identified as a beneficial user, but we have to standardize this, especially hopefully Europe could learn from this example. And it will also, we need to pay attention to how Argentina and Ecuador are doing to demand this, not just from small companies, but especially from a uh, listed companies that could manage millions of dollars and maybe there is no way to know who is behind that. So it's not just a great advance that any small company that operates within the boundaries of the country operate, but especially they said necessary with the major like big funds in which they invest a lot of money. And unfortunately, we don't know anything about the investors and only the general manager that is well known, but we also need to know in these large companies that are listed, who are all those other people but this is uh, working in the thresholds is important in Latin America. Thanks, Andres. And Tom, I see, is still with us. He has delayed uh, going off to eat his chocolate eclair for dessert and also has his hand up. So, Tom, you will be our final uh, speaker here. 
Thank you. I'm one of the people who found the other panelists so interesting, I didn't want to go to the beach. Um, there was a point I wanted to come back to, which is from Roberto, um, who mentioned partnership with the private sector. And that's one of the things that I've seen in country evaluations as being a real game changer in terms of effectiveness. Um, it's used a lot these days in anti-money laundering, but less so on tax cases. Um, and it's about creating a shared environment, a safe space in which banks, for example, can discuss with financial investigators, with financial intelligence units, actual cases. Um, they can share intelligence, they can share red flag indicators, they can try and understand what's going on. And given that each side only sees half the picture, uh, being able to have those conversations um, is really leveraging both of their knowledge and understanding and is enabling the countries that have set up these partnerships to, to be a lot more effective in going after bad behavior. So I'd recommend people to look at those cases and start thinking about that sort of approach. Thank you, Tom. Uh, and on that note, we're going to wrap up this session. Thank you to all of our panelists from joining us from wherever you are in the world. Thank you to everyone in the room for paying attention. Uh, I'm Will with ICIJ. Feel free to email me anytime if you ever want to talk. I'd love to talk back and I look forward to following uh, the event uh, tomorrow. Muchas gracias, señor Thank you very much, Mr. Fitchipon, for your moderation, and of course to the panelists for all the contributions that they have shared with us. I believe that in this session we have been able to meet one of the objectives of the declaration by the exchange of experiences, how this experience contribute to the different countries represented herein to try to improve the work that we are doing. I would like to thank you all for your participation. To Come, as we come to a close of this sixth meeting of the, the Punta del Este Declaration, I would like to thank you all for your participation. I would like to remind you that we will continue tomorrow. And of course, to thank all of those who are virtually, I were able to see people from Cape, uh, Mexico, Brazil, and some other countries, and everyone who's following us. I would like to thank you for attending us, for joining us, and those who are still here in the room, you have the afternoon free to enjoy the beauty of this country. We have given you a series of suggestions about nearby places that you can visit before you join us in the cultural activity in the National Theater. We will take several trips from here, the hotel that will start at 5.30 this afternoon, and the cultural activity for those who want to get there on your own, it's at 6 p.m. in the National Theory. We hope you will all join us there. Thank you very much. <laughs>